Okay, welcome. This is Rooted in Revelation podcast, where we seek to make God's revelation our foundation in all of life. And with my uh, me being one of the hosts, Nate, I have Nick and Sam with us, two of the other hosts. And Hello. Yeah, say hi. How's it going, <laughs> yeah. everyone? And um, we also have a special guest. Uh, Dr. Scott Oliphant is with us today. And what a privilege. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing well. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, we're so grateful for you and glad to meet you as well. Uh, Scott, or would you go by Scott, Dr. Oliphant? What sure. do you want? Whatever Scott's, you want. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I had one student one year that called me chief all semester. So, you know, it seems okay. like yeah. anything works. Yeah, we'll go chief. No, I was kidding. But, right. yeah. um, <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how the Lord uh, rescued you from sin and brought you to uh, uh, how the Lord brought him uh, you to himself, and also maybe share a little bit about how you got into apologetics. Yeah, um, be happy to. I was uh, raised in a Roman Catholic family um, because of my uh, mother, who was uh, strict Irish Catholic, and um, she uh, made sure that we went to Catholic schools. There were there were five kids in my family. There were, sort of three of us together and then a little distance in time and then two others. So the three boys, we kind of were all together. It was, you know, one grade, the other grade, the next grade kind of thing all the way through school. Um, so I was raised in a Catholic home, um, went to went to mass um, religiously, um, pun intended, and uh, we, we would go to, to mass uh, when we were in school as well. Um, said the rosary when we needed to we had we had uh one of one of our relatives would send us pictures of saints that we would put on the refrigerator and those were the saints of the month and we were meant to pray to them and um so it was it was that kind of upbringing my dad um, in order to please my mother eventually converted to catholicism um so the home was uh, overall um a moral um, you know, a kind of general morality there. My dad was a, a very hard worker and a, and a dear man. Um, and uh, at about the time when I got into high school, I rebelled against all that and told my parents I was done. And um, my mother wasn't happy. My dad kind of understood it. Um, so I, I went wild for a while, um, uh, very wild in high school. And uh, one, one day, and I'm I'm going to report this as it happened, even though I don't want you to read too much into this. But but one day I um, decided, uh, latter part of high school, that I was going to buy a Bible. Um, and I, to this day, I'm not sure why I decided that, but there was something going on with me. Um, obviously, the Holy Spirit's working at that point, because given my lifestyle, I wouldn't have done that. So so I skipped school, which was a tendency of mine, and uh, went to the religious bookstore and bought a Bible. And I remember walking to the bookstore, and I, I told the, the dear woman there, um, she had a pink, you know, sort of um, coat on and had her name. And I said, I, I need the cheapest Bible you've got. And she took me over to a King James paperback Bible. I remember it was four ninety five, and I said, that'll work. And um, it, it, I was raised Catholic, but as you may know, in Catholicism, you don't read the Bible much. You don't need to. Um, so I was not familiar much with the Bible at all. I'd heard Bible stories in Catholic school, that sort of thing, but I didn't know front from the back, really. So on this Bible, there were a list of various things to read. Um, if you're thinking about this, read this. If you want to know about this, read that. So I would just go through that a little bit and then um, uh, read, start reading the gospel some. Uh, I thought it might start the New Testament. Uh, during the course of that time, uh, I also was um, um, involved in Young Life to some extent, kind of off and on, if you know Young Life ministry, kind of evangelistic ministry to high school kids, and um, decided uh, at the end of my senior year that I'd go to a Young Life camp with a friend of mine. Um, and, and I went to that camp just after, uh, after high school graduation. As a matter of fact, um, the bus to take us to Colorado. This is in Texas. So the bus to take us to Colorado uh, was arriving at 4.30 in the morning. Well, the night before was my graduation. And just after that was my graduation party. And I wanted to make sure it was a party. So I was, I was almost uh, late for the bus, but my, my friend roused me and, and uh, 
got me to the to the bus in time. And so I, I got on the bus that morning and, and went to a, a, a camp in Colorado for the week. And when the speaker was speaking, um, all, all the things that I'd been reading in, in the Bible by myself started to kind of come together. So somewhere in that process, the Lord uh, changed my heart and it kind of crystallized for me at, at Young Life Camp. Um, and we had just um, gotten a new Young Life leader, uh, full-time uh, staff leader in Amarillo, where I grew up. And so he kind of took me under his wing and um, that summer. And he said, you know, the first thing you've got to do is read the Bible. Second thing you've got to do is read the Bible. Third thing. So I just started reading and reading and reading. And he would uh, help me and interact with me and, and um, do some Bible studies with me. And I eventually got, got involved in Young Life as a volunteer leader. Uh, under people, you know, because I wasn't really ready to do a whole lot of um, spiritual work at that point. I was a new Christian. Um, and then, um, so, so that went on for a, a year or two. I went into college uh, in, in the Emerald area. There's a, there's a university there called West Texas. It's a satellite of Texas A&M. And um, when I went to West Texas, uh, there, there was a philosophy professor there who was a Christian man, and I'd, I'd heard about him. Uh, he went to church in Amarillo. And um, so I thought I'd take some philosophy courses just because this guy was a Christian. And one of the courses he offered, he, he actually entitled the course Issues in Philosophy. And, and he told me later, one of the reasons he did that is so that he could teach anything he wanted in the class. And what he offered that semester was um, a, a course on Francis Schaeffer's uh, How Should We Then Live? If you're familiar with that series, it's, I think it's now available uh, free somewhere like Amazon or something. And um, uh, Schaefer had, had uh, his son had uh, produced this with, with his dad and he had, he had developed this film series. And so we had to read in this course, we had to read some of Schaefer's books and, uh, and um, also go through that film series. And uh, I was just riveted. It was the first time I'd met a thinking Christian, if you know what I mean by that. I mean, he was he was dealing with worldview issues. The other people who were discipling me were dear people and intelligent people, but Schaefer was the first one to sort of talk about the big picture. And, um, and I was riveted by that. As a matter of fact, he, he did a tour in the United States after that. And uh, I went down to Fort Worth where he was, uh, that was part one of his stops on the tour and uh, got to see him interact with people. They did the film series. He would come out and do a question and answer and and he interacted with people and was just, uh, you know, it was just a, a life changing moment for me in so many ways to, to watch him do that. Um, and then um, in uh, December of 1977, uh, Christianity Today uh, came out and appeared in my mailbox um, back when they had magazines that you could hold and turn pages and things. And, um, and the cover of the, um, of the issue, I've got it right over my desk here. It's uh, Cornelius Van Til, the legacy of a down-to-earth scholar. And they'd done an interview with, um, with Dr. Van Til. I'd never heard of him, um, but as I read the interview, uh, one of the things it said describing him was that uh, Van Til had taught such luminaries as uh, Francis Schaeffer and E.J. Carnell and other people. And so I thought, well, okay, I've read Schaeffer and, and have been diving into Schaeffer. It might be a good time to read the man who taught Schaeffer. So, so I went down to our local bookstore. I mean, this is, we're, we're talking in the late seventies here. So you have to think no internet, no phone, nothing. Um, no typewriter. I mean, it's just, you know, pen and paper kind of time. And I went down to the local bookstore and I'd written down the, um, the name of the book that the article um, had talked about, Defense of the Faith. And I said, I want this book, Defense of the Faith, Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company, and I showed it to the guy and he goes, I never heard any of this. Don't know the book, don't know the publisher. So he got, he got his books in print, you know, tome and plopped it on his, on the counter there. I remember this so vividly. And he flipping through, flipping through. He goes, okay, there. And he said, uh, we should have it in about a month. Uh, so this is, you know, in the days of Amazon, this is kind of inconceivable, but, um, you know, as a young kid who was kind of interested in this. Uh, I couldn't wait till it came in. I, it was like Christmas for me when they, they called me and said it was, it, it was, in, it was there. So I went down and picked it up and, um, and started reading through. And, you know, I didn't, in Amarillo, Texas, you don't have a big theological library uh, to help you. And, 
there's no internet uh, to help me. And so I would be reading things and I would skip class at the university and, and meet my philosophy professor for coffee. And I'd say, okay, here's what he's saying. What does this mean? And sometimes he would say, well, I think he's getting at this. And sometimes he would say, I have no idea what he's talking about there. So um, I, there, on, on the back of the book um, was a list of some of Van Til's publications. And at, at the bottom, it said, uh, Westminster Theological Seminary, P.O. Box 27009, Philadelphia, PA, 19118. I'd never heard of Westminster. Philadelphia to me was another country, kind of still is. Um, but um, but I wrote Westminster and I said, I'm, I don't have any resources here. I'm kind of struggling with some of these things. I'm, I'm really loving what I'm reading, but I need a little uh, help. Um, is there anyone there who, who might be willing to, to help me? They wrote back and said, um, Dr. Van Til has retired. And he said, uh, uh, please, please write him. And here's his address, um, 16 Rich Avenue. So, so I, I wrote Dr. Van Til and I, and I said, thanks for your book. I'm, I'm not quite getting this. I'm not quite getting that. And I didn't know what to expect in that first letter. Well, literally a week after I mailed it, letter appear, appeared in my mailbox. Uh, it was spiral pages, pages that had been torn out of a spiral notebook and fold it up and you know six or seven pages and he was just writing and writing and writing so so we did that for um for a while uh, maybe 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 a couple years back and forth and i wasn't writing him weekly but i was i was tr trying to get a hold of it trying to grasp and uh, eventually um i said to him uh would would you be willing to come to amarillo and and uh, and talk to some of us and, and help us and, and it, to my surprise he said this is 1980. He said his wife had just passed away and he wasn't teaching, so he'd be happy to come. And so he came down in 1980 and stayed with us for a few days. And he said, the only condition uh, is you have to take a walk with me every day. And, and, and I thought, well, this would be easy guys in his eighties. But I mean, he was picking them up and putting them down. Uh, he, he did a two mile walk every day. And I was just peppering him with questions. And I wish I'd have had, you know, an iPhone turn on and record. He was talking about Machen. He was talking about all the things that, uh, you know, his past was so important to him and Machen was still his, his idol in a human sense. And um, so we had, we had great conversations and, and great discussions. And, and eventually um, I, I decided it was time for me to, uh, to go get uh, seminary education. I wrote Van Til and said, I, I think I'm going to have to go to seminary. And at those day, in those days too, I was getting catalogs. I had a stack of catalogs at my desk. And um, I kept pulling out catalogs in Texas, you know, the place where you go typically is Dallas Seminary. It was conservative, believed in inerrancy. So I, I just assumed I'd be traveling down to Dallas and then uh, somewhere else. But once I got the Westminster catalog and compared uh, programs and uh, courses that are offered um, against everything in me as a, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, native Texan, I thought I'm going to have to go to the Northeast. And so I wrote Van Til and said, I I'm going to go to seminary. I think I'm going to come to Westminster. He wrote back and he said, great. Um, when you come up uh, to find housing, stay with me, use my car. You can stay as long as you need to. So I stayed with him for a couple of weeks and tooled around the area and found a place to live. And then my wife and I and our two little boys, Jared and his younger brother, we moved, moved here in 81. And um, so there you go. That's kind of the story. Uh yeah, that's 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 pretty incredible, uh, Scott. Thanks for sharing. I mean, I, it never gets old hearing your story. Um, I've I've heard it a few times back in the Reform Forum days, uh, years mm -hmm. and years ago, when you've been on there and kind of shared uh, about you know Van Til and the Clark controversy and some things like that. And yeah, um, uh, and I, it, the weird thing that always still sticks in my head is uh, one of the comments you made of when you you're talking with Van Til and you mentioned that you said you know. I wish, you know, things would have been different, you know, you know, Clark was a good guy and, and kind of him wishing things would have pond or planned or played out a little better, you know, and he always did say he was a better philosopher or however he worded he did. it. Yeah. yeah, he was so gracious. He was so gracious. And he, he said he was a better philosopher than I was, than I was, I wish we could have worked together. And, you know, that, that story gets so many narratives surrounding it that I yeah. think people miss the, the human side of it. I mean, Clark, Clark did get, you know, he got a little miffed and he left, but, but the complaint against him uh, was not upheld. So he could have easily stayed and, and, and worked with, with Van Til. And I think they would have, 
uh, sharpened each other in, in particular ways, but that, that wasn't to be. But, but I remember Van Til saying, he said this about Clark, he said this about Schaefer, he said, I pray for him every day. And, and when Van Til says that, it's not a, it's not a throwaway comment. You, you knew he was praying for those guys. So, you know, in, in his later life, um, I didn't know him in his younger days. Um, I, I think he, I think it was about the same. In his later life, he was just a, uh, an example of what it means to be a, an older, wise, pious Christian man. He just, I think I've said this before, but when I, when I took walks with him in his neighborhood, he was, you know, every neighbor I met, I think every neighbor I met said, oh, he's talking to you about Jesus too. And he, he just, that's what he did when he walked in the neighborhood and said hello to everybody. He would, he would bring up the gospel and, and want people to, to, to know that. And that was the passion of his life. That was, that was behind everything he wrote. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so incredible. Uh, yeah. It's something about knowing a bit of a, a biography of, of someone helps uh, kind of grapple you. Um, not just like, where's a theoretical, oh yeah, Van Til, but he was actually a human being, you know, like one yeah. of us. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was very much human. And, and um, yeah, there's something, uh, you know, me, uh, we all three go to the same uh, PCA church called I'm, uh, Armor Bible Church in uh, Orchard Park. Buff well, it's in the Buffalo, New York area. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, our pastor, Jonathan Hunt, I think he was a TA uh, with uh, Lincoln Duncan. Okay. For a period of time. And, um, you know, we've we met him and just very godly, good man. And, and it's just, it's something, you know, it's like the Paul Timothy dynamic where you're just, you, you see what a godly man he is and it stirs you up to want to be holier and stronger in the Lord. And it's just a, yeah, it's an incredible experience when you meet people unsure, like it was for you, like how Van Til was for you. And yeah, it's just, yeah, it's inspiring. Absolutely. You know, I, I have this vivid memory. Uh, again, he was sitting in our house in Amarillo and Christianity Today was on, on the table and I, and I opened it up. I was looking through it and uh, there was a quote from John Warwick Montgomery uh, and he he said uh, he was talking about Van Til and Van Til's method, and and he said um, uh, Van Til's descent into the abyss of fideism. So I read this to Van Til. I said Montgomery is saying this about descent into the abyss of fideism, and he started laughing. And he said that man is so clever; he can really turn a phrase. You know, it just didn't it didn't affect him at all. He just thought that was really he th he thought his essay in Jerusalem and Athens once upon an opera York. He thought that was clever. I mean, he really appreciated what he needed to appreciate. But of course, he's going to disagree foundationally with these guys. So, yeah, that was a. That was a lesson that, um, you know, I, I wish I could have learned immediately and, and quickly. And but, you know, over the years, you remember that and, and, and you try to you try to uh, 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 work out your salvation in the right way as you're thinking about those things. Mm. Yeah. So what was your era, Scott, with the whole, you know, Greg Bonson and were you kind of in the same class with him or was that later or before you or how? Yeah, all Greg. Greg had already left when I came. I think Greg was here, um, I think in the late seventies and he, he probably left in 79 and I came in 81. So, so Greg was, was finished and through and, uh, and then pretty quickly wrote his book on theonomy after that. Um, and I never had, I had a couple of, um, uh, touches with Greg uh, through the years, but we, we were never close or, or involved in each other's ministries at all, just because of our life circumstances. That was, um, that was the main reason. So um, yeah, I, ne I never had much uh, touch with Greg, but um, have greatly appreciated his, uh, you know, his Van Til's apologetic readings and analysis. That's just mm -hmm. a fine, a fine collection of Van Til's works. And I, I, uh, I required in, in uh, one of my classes. Great. Yeah. And that, uh, John frame was, was that around Bonson's time as well, or. Yeah, it was, um, I, I was sorry to miss frame. He, he left in 19. So in 1980, Westminster was kind of at the end of the shepherd controversy. And, and part of what Dr. Clowney did to try to mollify, uh, some of the heat that was on campus. Uh, this wasn't the only reason I, I don't want to uh, pitch it exactly that way but this was part of the reason is that they started Westminster West Westminster California uh, and they sent some some of the uh, anti-shepherd people out there not all anti-shepherd because frame was pro shepherd but frame went out because they needed somebody to teach apologetics out there so he went out to California in 1980 so I, I missed him by a year mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, had, uh, glad, oh, glad go ahead. to see you guys had him on. I, I think, oh. uh, it's nice to, nice to see, uh, John still active and so many of us have learned so much from him and, uh, he's a, he's a dear Christian man and has, uh, has done great things for the church and for the kingdom. And, um, I appreciate him very much. And, and so much of what he's done has been so useful and helpful. Mm. Yeah. I was, I was going to mention that, but you knew. So yeah, yeah. Um, he, he really is a godly man and we really much appreciate him as well. And um, did you have something, Nick? I see you kind of. I was just going to say, you know, you've done something right when Scott Oliphant knows who's been on your podcast. So yeah. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> Well, you so, know, once you once you had Jared on, I had to become familiar with what you guys were doing. So there's a family sort of connection here, and I was uh, yeah, I was glad to see that that Jared was on. I was glad to see you had you had John on. Um, both both good guests, good guys. Yeah, yeah, no, it it was great. Um, Scott, there's a question that I've had, and it's been a burning question for a long time. I'm a Baptist at present. Um, we just uh, Nate and I just switch churches to this Presbyterian church. And so I'm understanding Presbyterianism in what I say tongue in cheek after about 15 years of uh, Baptist propaganda. And so um, I've just never understood Presbyterianism in the way that it's iterated in our church, which is, you know, great. But uh, Spurgeon has a quote, and it's always seemed presuppositional to me. And I want to get your take on it. So Spurgeon, he said it a few different ways, but it's more or less the word of God is like a lion and you don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose and the lion will defend itself. So I know we haven't defined what presuppositional apologetics is yet, but um, I just can't wait. So uh, would you say that because Spurgeon was pre-Van Till, so there was no presuppositionalism. I think there was classicalism at that point, which he was opposed to based on the quote. Do you think that Spurgeon would have been a presuppositionalist had it been a formal apologetic discipline at that time? Yeah, um, I love these because it's, it's, not, it's not possible to be wrong. Um, you know, who knows? But, um, but here's, here's what I, I would say generally. Um, uh, and you know, I, I realize that this is this is this going to sound a little bit provocative, so I can flesh it out if we need to. But if your theology is reformed uh, in 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 the most consistent way, then um, your only option is to be what I call covenantal in your apologetic is to is to follow what what Van Til was trying to give to us because that's all he was trying to do. You know, he he was not really interested in people following him. He was interested in in the God, the trying God of scripture and, and recognizing that our allegiance had to be to him from first to last. Um, so you, you know, you, that's a great quote. And when you, when you begin reading people in the history of the church who had reformed theology, whether anachronistically or post-reformation, you, you begin to see the elements are really there. Uh, this is what Van Til saw. The elements were there in Bob Inc. and Kuiper, even to some extent in Warfield and Hodge. And what Van Til tried to do is sort of merge all this together to make it a little more systematic for us. So, uh, yeah, I don't have any question. Um, you know, we have a lot of Baptist students at the seminary, and there, there are a number of Reformed Baptists out there. And I, I love the Baptists. We, we can learn a lot. We Presbyterians can learn a lot from them. Um, but if they're Reformed Baptists, I think um, they, they've got to be uh, covenantal or, or, or reformed in their apologetic approach. Um, now, again, there are differences, of course, as you know, on, on the way we think about the covenant, but some of the basic uh, theological uh, premises and foundations are, are basically there. When you think about the Principia of the Reformation, the Principium Ascendi is the triune God uh, who created everything. The Principium Cognoscendi is God's revelation. Presbyterians and Baptists both hold to those. Uh, so you've got the Principia in place, and now it's just the fleshing out of, of what those things mean. And um, so in that sense, I think um, if you're Reformed in theology and you're not uh, covenantal, ventilian, whatever, um, then, uh, then there's a glitch. There's a theological glitch somewhere. And those are, those are things worth uh, pursuing and talking about, I think. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Uh, it's it's funny. Uh, so Nate and I, Nate and I have known each other a long time. Sam is quickly becoming a good friend, um, but we're both 
priests up guys we actually have both had um we we were both discipled by the same guy at different points in our lives and then we kind of came together and became good friends uh and we both found out we're pretty suppositional and um you know vantillion priest up and everything and uh i don't know are you familiar with the log college and seminary previously tinars no i'm not sorry it, no it's okay uh it's it's a school that i go to uh that has a it, it's free of cost um and it has a discipleship model basically where you're a qualified person in your church ideally basically oversees your education we just had the uh, president john mcdonald on and uh, he did an interview with us and uh, we found out that um the log college and seminary which is a great school but uh, they take a classical approach so uh it's interesting because we're going to have another conversation with him about uh you know the reasoning why it's a classical as opposed to a presuppositional just because you don't hear uh very many very many places doing that anymore that are reformed. Um, can you think of a, a reason why that would be a reformed school's approach um, as opposed to presuppositionalism? Because like you said, there's that, there's that glitch. There's something that's a little bit askew. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, when I, when I've seen uh, people uh, who would move in a more classical direction, um, what I've seen inevitably in those situations is some sort of theological glitch, um, you know, a, a place where there's a consistency issue, in, in my view, that's, that's worthy of discussion. Um, so, you know, I would, I would guess that um, if someone's saying they're reformed and they're going for a classical approach, they're probably not understanding now this is just a guess, so this is, this is all I'm getting. They're probably not understanding the depth of the noetic effects of sin, or maybe they're not understanding the uh, impetus behind the reformed uh, understanding of Principia, that is those foundations on which we all have to stand. Maybe they're not getting that. And, and sometimes there's a little bit too much um, of a, a, a uh, a kind of, uh, what's the best way to put it, a kind of view of reason that doesn't uh, get at the heart of what sin has done to our thinking capacity. Um, and, and that, you know, th those, those can be difficult, um, difficult uh, theological tenets to, to kind of own, but once you own them, you, you never go back. But, but before you do, you can tend to think, uh, since I say there's a tree and the unbeliever says there's a tree, we've got that in common and that's just the way it goes. So if I, if I say there's a cause effect relationship in the world and the unbeliever says that we're speaking the same language. Well, we're not really, um, we're saying the same thing, but the context is completely different, isn't it? So if, if you're not going to, if you're not going to be aware of that context, you're going to get yourself I think into a muddle and into a mess. So in my in my book, um, Covenantal Apologetics, I've got a chapter in there where I talk about the proofs. And one of the things I do is I take an actual, there it is, I take an actual um, dialogue between a Christian and a humanist and the Christian who takes a classical Thomistic approach, he's he's trying the cause effect scientific way. And then, and, and I, it's an actual discussion, which is why I wanted to use it. And then I try to take that apart and say, now here are the problems. Uh, with this, if you're reformed, it, it happens that the Christian who's in this dialogue is not reformed by his own profession. He's a Thomist. Uh, so so um, then, then what I do is I try to rework that whole argument using the cause effect relationship, but in the context of a, of a reformed theology and show that you can argue this way, but you've got to be very aware, cognizant uh, of, of your foundations and your principia if you're, if you're going to go that direction. Sure. No, that's really helpful. And uh, in no way was I trying to, um, you know, say anything negative about the classicist. I mean, you know, you have R.C. Sproul and a, a number of guys who are reformed and who do, uh, you know, subscribe to that model, interested in hearing, uh, you know, John McDonald's take on, you know, why the school went in that direction, as opposed to presup, because um, my understanding of it, just very simply, I'm a very simple person, is just that when you're starting with the classical approach, you're basically assuming that natural man 
can logic himself into regeneration, right? I mean, really, that's what it's doing. You're arguing from logic. You're trying to argue from logic into a spiritual truth, which just doesn't really comport. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and again, it goes to the noetic effects of sin, doesn't it? Because what, what, I, what I tell students in class is, and we, we have, you know, all, all kinds of students in, at Westminster. They come from various countries and all sorts of backgrounds religiously. And so I tell them in class, if you're an Arminian in your theology, then, then you're not going to be able to understand what we mean by Reformed apology. You're not going to be able to own this because your theology won't square with it. But if you're reformed in your theology, then this is this is the approach you're you're duty bound to take if you're going to be consistent. So, so so people who think that um, you know the the way that you can prove uh, theism, sort of a generic theism, is for example by way of cause and effect or contingency to necessity, something like that, and that I'm saying the same thing that the unbelievers saying, and we're on the same page. If you think that way then you've got to be Arminian theologically because Arminians think that way because they don't reckon, I think they don't reckon properly with the biblical truth about how sin has affected even our thinking, uh, which doesn't mean we don't think, it just means that everything we do think, we think as people and people are either in Adam or in Christ. That's why it's covenantal. You've got one head, who's your head? It's Adam or it's Christ and there's no in between. So, so if you're talking to somebody who's in Adam, you know, this, this, was, this was Bertrand Russell's problem. He, he, he understood the, the, the cosmological argument of cause and effect, but he said, this logically leads me to, then who made God? And, and if you say, well, of course, no one made God. Well, where does the of course come from? Well, if it doesn't come from scripture, uh, then, then you're not going to be able to, to say where it comes from if the cause-effect relationship is your foundation for your argumentation. The, you've already given up too much ground at that point. So, so that becomes the problem, and I think that that's exactly right. That's what you mean by logic your way uh, to God. It's not, it's not what we're meant to be doing. We don't throw logic out, but we recognize that logic is used either by one who's in Adam or one who's in Christ. Those are your only options. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I know we've been talking around what presuppositional apologetics is for a little bit here before we jump into maybe defining what that is. Um, Sam, do you have anything, Nate, do you have any other questions before we go there? Yeah, um, Scott, I was, I come from a Catholic background as well. And um, I was exposed in Catholic school to a lot of evidentialist apologetics. And it's interesting, because looking back, it was necessary but not sufficient for my conversion I think necessary in that it kind of um, laid that groundwork for you know the unavoidable truth that God had acted in history but not sufficient because without the spirit I you know spent 10 years trying to disprove it because I was in Adam um, so I was just wondering if, if going to Catholic schools and stuff you had any kind of similar background in that in like evidentialist approaches to the resurrection and stuff and whether that had any impact on you or on your conversion or on your thinking yeah, I, I didn't really because um, after sixth grade, um, my dad wanted us in a, in a public school so that we could play sports. And that, you know, that was a battle at home and, and he won that one. So, so, but, you know, it's interesting because uh, years ago, my mother sent me some papers that she'd found she'd kept somewhere and collected. And some of it was from my Catholic upbringing. And I was looking at some of the things that I'd written and I was, you know, I was writing the right stuff. I was writing out, you know, who Jesus is and what he taught and what the Bible is, all that. So surely, um, you know, somewhere uh, way back in the recesses of, of this old brain, there's, you know, there's, there's Catholic, um, there's a Catholic influence there in, in a good sense. Um, so I think just having that, uh, I mean, I, I still remember in the Catholic school singing some hymns that I still sing now in the Presbyterian church. So I think the Lord used all of that. Uh, thankfully, he saved me from it and out of it. But he also used it, I think, as a, as a kind of, uh, you know, generic sort of Christian background or generic religious background to, uh, to move me. Maybe that's why I still don't know, but maybe that's why I decided one day I'd go buy a Bible. Um, I just, I decided it was time to read the Bible, I'd done everything I wanted to do as a, you know, as a pagan. So I thought, why don't I read the Bible? Um, and maybe that, maybe that's what the spirit was using to do that. You know, what's really funny about that, Scott, as just as I'm listening to you, I was a kid who 
was very secular. You know, I was very moral without Christ, but then um, I met a young life leader and I started going to young life. And then um, I don't remember hearing the gospel at young life, but after that leader left my life and I was like a senior in high school, I just, the Lord, I was just discontent. And I just started reading my Bible. Cause that's just what I thought I needed to do. Cause I thought I believed in God. And it's just funny to hear you kind of echo some of those same young life, read the Bible kind of a thing. Um, yeah. It's great, isn't it? And and you and you see again in, in your own life how powerful the Word of God is. It it's the you know it's, it's the only thing with the Spirit that changes human hearts. And if you can get people to open it, read it, you know, there's there's where the Spirit works. So yeah, it worked. It was a uh, it was a it was a great thing in my life. Um, little did I know what was going to happen. Little did I know the Lord would call me to foreign country, Pennsylvania, and make me live here for thirty years. But that's that's what He's done. Yeah, I'm uh so I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Um and oh. as a and as a pagan, I uh I'm sad to admit that I didn't realize the rich um heritage of Westminster Philly and and all that stuff, but um you know, later when the Lord saved me out of, you know, drugs, alcohol, probably similar stuff as you. Hmm. Um I, you know, I went through this program called Teen Challenge, which was like hmm. Assemblies of God, David Wilkerson, the cross switchblade yeah. stuff. Yeah, I went through that. Lord greatly used that, got a lot of false doctrine, but a lot of decent doctrine that led me to Calvinism and then Presbyterianism, Morpho, you know, and, wow. and experienced all that. But all that to say, I just wish I wouldn't been a Christian in Pennsylvania because yeah. uh, I could have, um, you know, there's just a lot of rich OPC, PCA <laughs> church. You know, I just, I'm like, man, what was yeah. I doing running the right. streets? I could have been there, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, the Lord had another plan. So it, yeah, it's uh, that's good too. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, so I grew up in, uh, well, I grew up in like Camp Hill, um, Mechanicsburg oh, yeah. area, and then I lived in Hershey most of my yeah. childhood life, yeah. So. Yeah, good, good, yeah, know that area. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Nick, did you want to kind of kick into um, talking more specifically presuppositional apologetics, or as Dr. Oliphant likes to say, covenantal apologetics, which yes. I yes. I actually like better than presup, because it presup just sounds, I don't know, corny to me. <laughs> but Good it's just a, it's just an easy word to <laughs> quickly spout out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it, I think you talk about it in your book. I read it years ago for an apologetics class I took. Um, and it's, it's a great book. Everybody listening should pick it up and read it. But uh, you know, it's kind of like you mentioned, there are a lot of different names for something which makes it uh, difficult, but uh, yeah, I like covenantal apologetics better as well for, for the same reasons that you mentioned we're either in Adam or Christ, but yeah, um, to kind of get us started, uh, Dr. Oliphant, I'm going to use your formal name now since we're getting into educational topics. Um, where do you think the best place to start with a with a basic intro for our audience would be regarding um, what presuppositional apologetics is? Uh, just for context, most of our listener base, I think, doesn't have a background in apologetics. Um, so we're kind of starting from the ground up. So wherever yeah. you think a good place would be. Yeah, well, um, I, in, in some ways, I, I, um, I hesitate to say this because I, I don't like uh, self-promotion. I'm not, I'm not saying this for this reason, but uh, I wrote a book years ago called The Battle Belongs to the Lord. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to write that uh, was to um, challenge myself to, to explain some of the key passages in scripture that deal with apologetics in a way that wouldn't be wordy, um, that wouldn't be um, academic in, in the sense of uh, needing a seminary or, or even college education to understand it. Um, so, uh, and, and, and another thing that I did while I was writing that book is I was reading through the Bible, Genesis Revelation, I decided I was going to write down passages in scripture that deal with apologetics. So at the end of that book, I, I put, I really uh, set up an index passages that deal with apologetics in scripture. If we think of apologetics generally as defense and as, as a, as a war between, uh, you know, um, um, God and, and those that would oppose him, uh, it's, it's everywhere when you start uh, looking at it. And I, I think one of the best, th even if, even if that book's not um, the first place you start, I think one of the best things that people can do is to, um, is to recognize what, what Peter tells us, first Peter three fifteen that the apologetics is for the church. Uh, we're all meant to set Christ apart as Lord and to be ready to defend. 
it's not a it's not a command given to academics. It's not a command given to professionals. It's it's a command given to people in the pews and all of us together. And and if the Lord um, wants us to do that, He gives us what we need to do it. And uh, what we need is is His Word and the Holy Spirit. And and then then we need to be aware of the effects of sin and what's happening out there. So. So as you know, as somebody once said, it's a good idea to have a Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. There aren't any newspapers anymore, but you get the idea. Uh, read your Bible, uh, watch the news, uh, read whatever you read about what's happening in the world, but understand those things in light of what you read in the Bible and start and, and start to recognize when you're reading the Bible, there's there's an apologetic impetus in it um, because the war is going on. And so see that impetus in scripture and and equip yourselves uh, by reading and and recognizing uh that that it's only the power of the word that can that can break the shackles of uh of the of sin that that surround our hearts and and then and then start then you can start reading you know books like battle belongs to the lord my colleague bill edgar wrote one reasons of the hearts another good one um, there, there are there are books like that out there. I actually, um, Oz Guinness wrote a great book. I think it's called Fool's Talk on Persuasion. Um, I, I love everything Oz writes. Um, he's he's uh, he's just got a way of understanding and saying things uh, that I think is very helpful. A couple places in there I'd want to tweak, but um, things like that, uh, you know, people can can get involved in without getting into the deep and heavy philosophical. Uh, language and literature that sometimes you, sometimes uh, people have to do in order to 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 work with what's what's uh, going on out there because so many of the attacks sometimes against Christianity come from philosophical circles and academics and that sort of thing. So so there are people who need to be aware of those things and none of us uh, is aware of all of them. We we all have our own little uh, niche that we try to occupy. Uh, but but uh, read your Bible and then read books that deal with the Bible and apologetics, I would say start there. Don't start with a Kalam cosmological argument or, you know, a, 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 you know, a book on Thomism. Don't, don't go there because that's just, you get, you get weighed down and people get frustrated rightly. And so uh, start with biblical uh, material and, and, and cut your teeth on that for uh, a year or two or three. And then, then maybe you, you can move into areas that you might be uh, more interested in. That's awesome. Thank you. Quick question in regards to books. Um, are you familiar with Vody Bauckham's expository apologetics? Uh, you know, um, I'm pretty sure, I hate to even say this this way, I'm pretty sure I wrote a puff for that book. Um, and, and, and if I did, I read it at one point. Um, and my my vague memory is um, I thought Vody did a really nice job in it, but I, I, I'm uh, the details of it right now are escaping me. Unfortunately. Yeah, I, I've just read a I've read a bunch of Van Til, and Van Til can be a little tricky to read. I've read a number, mm -hmm. I've read at least a couple of your books, Expository Apologetics, and Fool's Talk is a wonderful book. A lot of people when I picked it up were like, "Oh, you're trying to persuade people, isn't that manipulation?" and for anybody who uh, wants to understand appro the appropriate use of persuasion, uh, if you're not comfortable with going to the scripture for that, Fool's Talk is an excellent book on that topic. Uh, but no, we should be persuasive. Paul was persuasive. Jesus was persuasive. You know, we should be these things for the glory of God, but not in a manipulative way. Um, but yeah, um, I, I really liked Vody's book. It kind of reminded me of um, the one Bonson book that I think is typically one of the first books people are encouraged to read. I can't remember the name of it always offhand. Ready, maybe. Yes. Always ready. Yeah. yeah right. Kind of reminded yeah. me of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you, could you tell us what presuppositional apologetics, covenantal apologetics, uh, what that argumentation is? I know that you just said it was based off of, uh, you know, a re reform theology sufficiency of scripture. So what does that look like in the average person's life as they would do, as, as they would carry out a presuppositional apologetic encounter, I guess? Yeah. Um, you know, that the, I think one of the beauties of the Reformation um, was that um, those uh, geniuses that the Lord raised up in the 16th, 17th century and uh, that the Lord motivated uh, to bring the church back to its roots. Um, those 
those guys were uh, so uh, wise in the way that they had to ferret out what scripture is for the church. And that, that was just a big deal. Um, we, we don't, I don't think we get how big a deal it was in the 16th century because during that time and prior to that time, uh, the Roman church was telling everybody, don't worry, um, just believe what we say and, um, and we'll take care of what the Bible says. You know, it was, um, if you've been raised Catholic, um, this, this is how it goes in your home. I remember having this conversation with my dad. He said, you know, what, what I, he, as he'd become a Catholic, he said, what I learned is um, there's no Bible unless there's the church. And, and so we, we trust the church in what it says and uh, what it tells us to do. And so that was in the air um, in, in uh, you know, in a significant way. And, and what happened uh, in, in, at the time of the Reformation is uh, Luther, but particularly Calvin, Calvin had to think deeply and, um, and, and, ex and, and as exhaustively as he could about the matter of scripture itself. And here's where we get into prolegomena. And, and what he began to see was that scripture is the foundation, not the church. Scripture alone is self-attesting. It, it attests to uh, its own authority. Uh, so when, uh, when you see the Westminster Confession, chapter one, dealing with scripture, it's doing that. In chapter two, dealing with God, it's doing that to set forth the reform principia, scripture and God, cognoscendi, essendi. And, and, when, and when the confession is, is laying out our, our doctrine of scripture, which is supposed to be a Protestant doctrine, by the way, all, Protestants are supposed to believe this, all of them. Um, but unfortunately, it's kind of become just a Presbyterian, even though the Baptists have the same sort of thing, London, London Baptist and um, so, but, the, but in section four of the Westminster Confession, the authority of scripture is set forth. Uh, the authority of scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed um, depends not on any man or church, but wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly upon God, who is truth itself, and is to be received because, here's the, here's the because, because it is the word of God. That's the best concise summary of self-attestation that you get. Every Protestant has to believe that because if you don't believe that, then, then whatever evidence you think is, is uh, uh, meant to be supportive of your belief in scripture, that becomes your foundation, that evidence. So maybe it's the evidence of the church and its councils. Okay, now the church is your authority. The church tells you, what to believe uh, in terms of the Bible. And now the church is your principium. And, and Calvin and the reformers were very clear um, that, that revelation has to be your principium, your foundation. So when we're talking about a, a, a biblical approach to apologetics, we recognize that we always stand on scripture as our foundation. We don't stand on it as if to stand over it. We stand on it as the only foundation um, on which we can stand if we don't want to stand on quicksand, because anything else you stand on is going to sink, and you're going to sink with it, and, and you're not going to be able to stand there, and you're going to have to move to something else, and then to something else, and to something else. So one of the things that Van Til helped us recognize is uh, that the history of philosophy is uh, replete from beginning to end with uh, more and more trial and error with respect to foundations for, uh, for, for reality, uh, principium ascendi, and for knowledge, principium cognoscendi. So all, you, so all he did was read the history of philosophy and say, every history of or every Western uh, philosophical position is moving in a direction. And then guess what? The philosophers say, no, that doesn't work. That's not sufficient. So we have to start something else. No, that doesn't work either. So we have to start something else. So you've got the rationalists. What happened to the rationalists? You know, they, 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 that, that failed. Uh, so the empiricists came along, so, said the a priori is not going to help us. The rational tenets aren't going to help us. So it's going to be empiricism. Uh, Hume, the most radical empiric. What happened with Hume? Skepticism. So then Kant comes along, Thomas Reed comes along. So part of what Van Til's helping us see is that the history of philosophy shows us 
that if you don't have the Bible as your foundation, you are doomed to failure because it's the only thing, God's revelation, because it's God speaking, is the only thing that can support what we need as human beings. So when we're talking about reasoning presuppositionally, we're, what we're saying is you recognize that God is who he says he is, uh, and he's the creator of all that is, and he's distinct from creation utterly. Uh, so there's, there's creator and there's creature. And then you recognize that God condescends to speak in and through and to his creation such that we can know who he is by virtue of that speech. Um, and and those, are, those are the things that we, that we carry into any apologetic or evangelistic discussion. Th those are the things that we have to stand on uh, and stand with if we're going to pr uh, present a defense of Christianity or even present the gospel. Those things have to be there, and, and those things can't be moved. They can't be shaken, or we're going to get ourselves into the position of uh, philosophers throughout the centuries who have, have failed every time they've tried something else. Yeah, that's a great presentation. Well, hey, <clears throat> Scott, isn't that circular reasoning? I mean, that's fallacious, right? Like you can't <laughs> just have a starting point like that. You have to prove uh, that position first, right? Yeah, so um, it it is circular reasoning in the sense that um, you, you everyone starts somewhere. Um, and, and one of the reasons we call it a principium, it goes all the way back to Aristotle's use of the word arche, which is the Greek word, um, kind of translated in Latin as principium and then uh, to, to us as foundation. Um, so what Aristotle recognizes is that you cannot go infinitely backwards in support of what you want to affirm. You've got to stand somewhere in order to assert anything. For Aristotle, it was on the law of non-contradiction. You got to stand there in order to assert, affirm anything else, and then you move forward. Uh, and there's there's no there's no possibility of of proving that because it is it is what it is as it is was Aristotle's view. And so the reform took that language over, and and recognized that for us that's God's revelation. We we stand there, uh, but we don't just say it is what it is what it is. We say if you if you don't here's Van Til's point. If you don't stand there. You've got no place to stand at all. So, so try standing somewhere else, and I'll come over with you while you stand there for the sake of argument, and let's talk about where that takes you. Let's talk about where you go. But recognize that when you stand there, you're reasoning circularly too, because you're standing in a particular place, and the place on which you stand is itself a foundation. If it's not, then go back to the foundation. Go back again to another foundation. Then let's talk about that as your foundation. So Van Til's point is, this is the human condition. We all think this way. We all reason this way. Um, and for the Christian, we just say, um, because only by God's grace, we say we stand here and we couldn't stand anywhere else. And if we try to stand somewhere else, just like everyone else, it's going to result in failure. And, th and that's what we have to help people understand, I think. Would a very simplistic way to put that, Scott, be to say that there has to be an ultimate authority that can't be justified by anything above itself because there is nothing above itself. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And that's one reason uh, why I think Westminster confession one four is so helpful because they, they recognize that you've got two options here. You, you either uh, trust what the church in, in this context, trust what the church says about the Bible so that your trust in the Bible is dependent on the church, and therefore the church is your foundation, or you trust the Bible for what it is. Those are your only options. So you can substitute church for man. You can substitute church for philosophical position. You trust that philosophical position in order to trust the Bible. That philosophical position is your foundation. It can't be that, because then it, it is your ultimate. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I've, I've written on this in a couple of places, but John Owen has a great... Um, assessment of the of the circular reasoning issue and and he in in one one place in his in his uh, collected works uh, he says uh yeah we do reason this way but it's not a vicious circle let me tell you why and he goes through a couple of points talking about the objective and the subjective and the holy spirit and the public access that we have to the bible but then he then he turns around and says oh and says oh by the way uh, it's the papists as he puts it it's the papists who reason in a circle and he shows how 
it's the Roman Catholics who are actually reasoning in a vicious, vicious circle and not the Protestants. So it's a, it's a brilliant. Um, so to think that Van Til is the only one who talked about circular reasoning is, to, is, is not to recognize what's happening in the reality of scripture um, and the way that we think about that. Um, Scott, what? Sorry, I'm uh, looking for my other headphones here because my <laughs> they're Bluetooth dying out. Are dying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'll try to make my question long and slow, so it'll give you some time to mess with that. <laughs> um, so this is a question I've um, had on occasion that I'm glad it popped in my head. But first, you know, often you hear classicalists say something like, "Well, you have to start with yourself." first, um, right, you have to start with your own sense, per, uh, sense perception or cognitive faculties to use in order to understand the Bible. Right. Um, so I've heard answers of that. But my second question would be like, well, don't we have to start with ourselves to, in, you know, do the interpretation, the hermeneutical work, right? So would that, in a way, be kind of like, um, so yeah, we're not saying the church um, should be our authority. Yeah, we're not saying uh, somebody's philosophical grid should be the right thing, but wouldn't that still include the fact that we still have to start with our own interpretation and that could still be problematic? Yeah. Does that make I sense? Think it does. Okay. And I think, you know, when, when Van Til was dealing with this, you know, he, he talks about the difference between Descartes and Calvin. Uh, so Descartes, uh, uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Sorry, I think I think you're. Can you still hear me? You can hear me. Okay, I can't hear you, but I'll I'll take these out and and we'll see what happens here. Sorry, this is my technological glitch. Um, I'll just turn this up. No problem. It keeps it real. Okay, good. I can hear you now. Can you hear me still? Yep. Okay. So. Um, so Descartes, um, I think, therefore I am. And what Van Til is saying is um, that that was that was a, a purported starting place for Descartes uh, in order to find uh, uh, you know a sort of indubitable, uh, clear, distinct idea. That's really what he wanted. He wanted to you know he was kind of the first of the critical philosophers. He wanted to throw out all dogma as a Catholic and say I don't want to start there. So I've got to figure out. So so that's he starts with cogito ergo sum, and what happens? You get the Cartesian circle of uh, how do you get outside the subjective? Well, method three, you get to the existence of God. But wait a minute, how does the existence of God relate to method one? So you get into that Cartesian circle. That's a problem. Um, and then, and then Calvin uh, says um, he begins with uh, the proper knowledge of God and the proper knowledge of ourselves. Um, so, so when you so. Frame has helped us on this. I think the, the, the ambiguity with the idea of start with can sometimes throw us off. Van Til says, uh, in, in terms of approximate starting point, we all start with ourselves because we can't get outside of ourselves to start anywhere else. The remote starting point, that is the starting point given who we are, uh, has to be the trying God and in, in, in what he has said in, in his word and in the world. Uh, so, so if we talk about start with in a Cartesian way, we see that, that the cogito died and, and, and led to a, a, a sort of Cartesian circle and, and uh, you know, a sort of circle that he couldn't get out of uh, and led to nothing but a, a subjectivism. If we have a, a Calvinian start with, we recognize that true knowledge of God and true knowledge of self sort of go hand in hand. You don't know you're a sinner until you recognize God is holy. Once you see who God is, you see more who you are. God's a creator, you're the creature, etc. So in that sense, what Van Til is saying, you start where Calvin started and not where Descartes started. But all of us start with ourselves in order to get to that point because we are uh, creatures of God made in his image. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, because I've often struggled with the hermeneutical kind of questions of being like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, because you know what Catholics and stuff, the caricatures, are, oh, there's 33,000 denominations. You guys are fools. Look what you did. There's no certain you can't have certainty on any interpretation you have. 
which I think is far reaching anyway. Um, I think we agree, as B.B. Warfield said, uh, as all the sciences go that, um, you know, Christians probably agree way more than any other science of the field would. Um, uh, yeah. Brant Bosserman shared that with us. Um, yeah. I'm sure you know who he is. Yeah, I do know him. Yeah, he's a good man. Yeah. And, you know, um, you would know some of you would know as, as a Catholic and if you still watch what the Catholics are doing to pretend that there's uniformity under that big umbrella uh, is just, um, you know, an illusion. And they, they know that. I mean, there's there's just so much um, uh, so many, so many differences in Catholicism. I was in um, I was in Rome a couple of years ago doing a, a week long um, uh, seminar with some other people uh, in um, a ministry called the Reformed Initiative, a group of Protestant guys who are trying to reach out to Catholics in Rome. And I mean, it's, you know, you're, you're right smack dab in the middle of it. And um, it was, it was fascinating because all the people at this seminar who came uh, to learn were from various countries, but they're all dealing with Catholics in their own country. So, you know, people from Ireland and Prague and all sorts of places there. And uh, they were talking about the massive differences between Catholics in, in their various, not only between countries, but in those countries, you know, debates and, and things like that. So uh, there's, there's not uniformity, even though one might call himself a Roman Catholic, he's, he could be as different um, from other Roman Catholics as Protestants are from pagans, really. I mean, there could be just vast, vast differences. Um, mind if I ask a question, Nate? Send it away, sir. All right. So I have kind of a big multifaceted question for you. So I have been in years past, thankfully, uh, I, I, I spend more time with my family now because I found that I valued internet fellowship too much in the past. But back when I used to live on my phone and Facebook, I used to be in a bunch of apologetics groups. And uh, any, you know, any group where there's Vantillians and Clarkians, you know, there's going to be arguing over, oh, you know, you should read Clark, you should read Van Till. And um, I, I've asked, you know, a couple handfuls of Clarkians to explain to me what is the difference between Clark and Van Til's approach to uh, presuppositionalism. And I've never gotten anyone to give me a concise answer. Maybe it just is too complex to be given, but they always just tell me to go read Clark and that, uh, that it can't be exp explained um, easily or briefly. Uh, so my first question is, can you give me a brief summation of the differences between Clark's presuppositionalism and Van Til's presuppositionalism? And then after that, could you... Um, maybe talk about the different flavors of presup for between like uh, yourself, John frame and Bonson, since you were all direct disciples of Ventil, probably the most, the most prominent. Wow. Yeah. That's a um, tall order. Yeah. It's a tall order. You uh, don't have to do all that. We, you know, I don't want to be inconsiderate of your time. So no, that's fine. I'll, I'll see what I can do here. Um, you know, when you live with things for so long, you're, you're never quite sure you're communicating well because there's so many things you've, you know, you've dealt with over the years. So um, can I do the Van Til Clark thing briefly? I think, um, uh, I think, I think when you interviewed John, he, he said he's got a section uh, in, in one of his books on that, that, that might be useful. I, I would say the fundamental difference is um, Clark was uh, more concerned, uh, you know, I, I want to be, um, I want to be fair here, uh, as a Christian, solid, uh, reformed Christian, Clark was more concerned with the, um, the question of consistency, logical consistency, than he was with um, the reality of the Principia. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't understand the Principia as the triune God in God's revelation. Of course he did. Uh, but for him, uh, apologetically, um, he, he was fairly convinced that, um, that logic was the way in to a proper discussion about 
Christianity. So, you know, his famous Wheaton lecture in the beginning was logic, and logic was with God, and logic was God. That was the way he sort of paraphrased John 1. He didn't mean that, of course, in the literal sense, but um, uh, I, I did, um, when I was at an ETS uh, meeting 30 years ago, maybe, um, there was a presentation given on logic that I went to, and the presenter um, is irrelevant here, but there was a question uh, after the presentation, and this man asked the question with a straight face, and he said, Would, wouldn't you agree, this way he put it, wouldn't you agree that, that God is an Aristotelian when it comes to logic? Uh, and I sort of looked, you know, I was struck by that, and, and it happened to be one of Clark's uh, closest disciples um and he was serious about that and and see i think i think when you begin to think that way uh you've you've prejudiced uh logic in a way that is um is not helpful for for the christian faith so the presupposition for um for clark was uh, the axioms of scripture. And, and uh, he was, you know, as, as you probably know, he was very uh, anti-evidence and, and uh, did, did not think the empirical could give what is needed apologetically so that you, you need to focus strictly on the rational. Um, so that, that became a problem. Um, and, and I think in the, in the controversy with Van Til, it sort of fleshed itself out in terms of uh, what was called the incomprehensibility of God. Uh, and, um, you know, that's probably not a good title for what was going on, but, but part of what was happening in that controversy was uh, Clark, Clark wanted to, to, uh, to affirm that there had to be some sort of univocal core to what God knew and what I know so that there can be a, a rational connection between the two. If there's no univocal core, what's the connection? And, uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's worth noting here historically that the ones who opposed Clark initially and the way he was thinking about these things were John Murray and Ned Stonehouse. Van Til came in uh, after that, um, uh, but was not centrally engaged at that point. Uh, so that's, that, that's worth noting because it was kind of a, you know, Murray recognized that um, if, if we're going to affirm God as triune and self-existent and asse and all those kinds of things, uh, then there really can't be a coincidence between what's in his mind and what's in my mind. Um, because what's in his mind is infinite, eternal, uh, unchangeable, uh, and, and, it, and, and all of those things we can't even think about. I, you can't think about eternity. It's not there because we're creatures. And, and, and yet that's who God is. And, and all those things in his mind are that because he, he is his knowledge. So uh, so Murray understood that, and when he heard Clark say there's a, there's a univocal point and there's a point of identity between what's in God's mind and what's in my mind, they became very concerned, um, and, and I think rightly became very concerned. Um, to, and, and, it, and just to, you know, to bring, bring this as close as possible to our, our current context, you, you may have seen uh, Clark's last book was on the Incarnation. Uh, he didn't get to finish it. I think uh, Robbins finished it for him. But I do know that, that this part in the book he did write, uh, he's got a footnote in there saying that we, we need to affirm as Christians that Christ is two persons. Now, you know, that's a problem. That goes all the way back to, um, you know, to Christological uh, problems in the church, in the early church. But, but Clark felt the need to affirm that because, because logic was so important to him. And I, and I think that's what Murray and Stonehouse and Van Til were seeing back in the early days. This, this could lead to problems in the future. As a matter of fact, it did. So, so the different, the, this is why I hate the term presupposition because everybody presupposes something. So Clark's presupposition, Van Til's presupposition. So uh, Clark for Clark, it's, it's, it's axiomatic. Uh, it's, it's biblical axioms for Van Til. It's the, it's the reformed uh, principia. They're close in so many ways, and this is why Van Til wished they could have worked together, because Clark was so bright in areas where Van Til wasn't. But um, but it but I think Clark's um, presuppositions uh, were not useful and did and didn't lead him in the right direction. Um, as as a as a reformed Christian gentleman who I'm certain is with the Lord now. So these are you know we're talking about in-house uh, kinds of um, 
critiques here. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, Clark's com the complaint against Clark was denied. I wish he'd stayed and, um, and help, help the church um, even more than he did possibly. But um, so I would say, uh, so, so that's the answer to the first question. Um, and this leads to the answer to the second question. The reason that I loathe the term presuppositional, which I think is going to hang around, so I don't care if you guys use it, that doesn't bother me. But the reason I don't like it, and I'm, I'm loathe to use it, is because of it, partly because of its ambiguity. Um, I, I met uh, I met an apologist, a classical apologist, not Sproul, somebody you probably wouldn't know, but uh, I, I met him uh, when I was still in Texas in pastoral ministry. He'd come to Amarillo, and so uh, we had a chance to chat. And, uh, and he asked me, he said, are you presuppositional? I said, yes. And he said, well, are you uh, Schaeferian or Carnelian or Clarkian or Vantillian or Henryan? So that, that was my first clue to, wait a minute, he, this isn't, this isn't helping. This word is not helping because now we've got a big umbrella under which guys fit that have pretty vastly different views of, of how to do apologetics. So that's one reason uh, I think the term is, is too ambiguous. The other reason is it's a, it's a kind of philosophical term that makes, makes people think that what we're really interested in is philosophical ideas when what we're interested in is biblical principles in the first place. So so I've picked the term covenantal. You could pick the term reform. That's okay too. It's broader, but it works. Um, in, anything like that, I think, is a better way uh, for us to recognize what Van Til was up to. So I would say in terms of Clark's Principia, he was not reformed just in the sense that his emphasis on the axioms of scripture was not the same as the reformed emphasis on on uh, God's revelation as, 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 Principi as the Principium Cognoscendi. Um, so in, in that sense, I think it, it helps us to recognize differences. Uh, Carnell was the same way. Um, you know, Van Til has these great quotes from Carnell, bring on your contradictions, you know, all this. Um, he's, he's wanting to, to, to tout consistency. Now, consistency is important, uh, but it can't be all important because it has to be defined biblically first. And so how, how do we understand consistency when we're thinking about Scripture and what Scripture teaches? That's an important question to ask, an important question to answer. So, so I would say um, that the term presupposition, you know, it was given to Van Til. He didn't actually put it on his own system, but um, it was given to him in, in the 40s, actually earlier than that verbally, but in print, it was given in the late 40s by uh, uh, J. Oliver Buswell, and Van Til just took it. It's okay, if that's what you're going to call me, I'll, I'll take that, um, but, um, you know, I have, I have faint hope, but I have some hope that the term will die and, and something else will come in to replace it. It'll be a little, little better, a little more descriptive, a little more helpful uh, to the church. I think presuppositionalism is just, uh, you know, to me, it's just uh, philosophical. It's, it's weighty. It's ambiguous. It just doesn't give us what we need. Having said that, I'm fine if you guys use it, of course. I think it's going to stay, but I just don't like to use it because I don't think it communicates Van Til's heart in what he was trying to do apologetically. Yeah, me personally, I've been I've been trying to escape it, but it's like, you know, <laughs> it's just a bad habit, you could say. Um, but no, well, yeah. Well, like, you know, um, James Anderson uses it. And yeah. I respect James. He's, he's just a great apologist. And so if he wants to use it, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, rail against that. But I don't use it in class. And and, and I tell my students, you know, just, just don't. If, you know, around me anyway, just, you know, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. James Anderson's great too. I, I yeah. often joke around and say, I wish he was my, my father in a weird way <laughs> because he's got the cool accent and uh, yeah. he just sounds infallible. You know, it's when you have that, that accent and you talk about the Lord, you're kind of like, yeah, whatever he says must be true. You know, that's not fair because the Lord uh, <laughs> cursed, cursed me with a Texas accent. And, you know, I would much prefer Scottish. Uh, the elephants came from Scotland. So I wish we could have kept that, but yeah. unfortunately it didn't happen. Oh, you have a great accent too from Texas still, I think. So, yeah. Sam, how you doing, man? Uh, you got anything boiling in uh, your brain there? Yeah. Um, not to, hmm. I had something, but it, you, go ahead. I, I had to slipped away. But, okay. Um, well, just raise your hand when you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Scott, um, so it's been about an hour. How are you doing? I'm okay. You sure? Okay. Just want to yeah. give you, yeah. I want to be respectful of that with you. Um, it's a privilege. We want to honor you in that. And um, 
So you just, you know, if we start going, just, you know, let us know. Be like, hey, I'm done here. You guys. Yeah, if, I, if I start snoring, you know, it's done. <laughs> Other than that, I should be okay. Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, Nick, go ahead, man. Um, so, yeah, you and um, Bonson and Frame all knew Van Til personally. And um, I think if I remember correctly, you three or maybe it was just you and Bonson were the only people that Van Til ever let teach in his class, right? I never taught in his class. No, okay. I, I, I knew Van Til post teaching career. So um, uh, I never taught in his class. I'm, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Greg did while he was here. Okay, cool. What are there any differences in, uh, you know, your, in each of your flavor of apologetics, um, you know, that, uh, that you learned from Van Til? You know, there are probably, uh, I would say, differences in emphasis, which is going to be natural for, for people. I mean, you know, this is the case across the board, isn't it? If we're, if we're all Reformed Christians, we're going to have different emphases at various parts in our lives and various things that we hang on to more than others. Um, so I think that's good. Um, Bonson, uh, you know, his he was just so good at interpreting uh, Van Til and, and getting kind of the, the core of what Van Til was trying to do and then explaining that for, for everyone else. I think he was the first uh, best interpreter of Van Til, but his emphasis um, was, was much more in the philosophical side of things. Again, that's not a critique, that's an observation that he sort of emphasized that. So, so I think for Greg, um, you know, he was very good at explaining and utilizing the transcendental method as, as Van Til wanted it laid out and wanted it used, uh, the so-called impossibility of the contrary. Uh, Greg was very good at that. Um, when, when, I, when I read Greg, um, oftentimes, just oftentimes, there's not as much of a gospel emphasis uh, as I think um, Van Til would have, would have given and would have wanted. And again, I think that's because he was moving more in philosophical circles. I'm sure you've heard one or two of Greg's debates, and he was just a master uh, when, he, when, he, when he did those sorts of things because he had it. You know, it just got into his, his bones, into his system. Uh, so I would say that for, for Greg. Um, you know, John uh, uh, developed his perspectivalism. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's a, an emphasis he's had uh, over the years. Uh, he saw some of that in Van Til. When Van Til's writing his ethics, a syllabus, he's talking about goal, motive, and standard. He's got this uh, three different, uh, he didn't make that up, that's been there. So three different ways of understanding uh, ethics and, and uh, frame uh, like that and, and, and took off and, and developed that um, a good bit. Um, in, in various ways. That hasn't been my uh, emphasis in, in apologetics, but again, we all have our emphases, and, and I think the, you know, the church is better by, um, by seeing these things and evaluating them and assessing them and adopting some, maybe adopting all. That, that's all a good thing. So, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, at my age and get in, in my career, I'm just thrilled when I see people who say, you know, Van Til really turned the lights on for me biblically and theologically, and and I think that's where, you know, that's where my, my emphasis is. If, if, if you can get there, uh, then I think we're on the same page. And then everything else is kind of a, a matter of, you know, what's your emphasis at this point? What, it, what are you wanting to put forth and, and how are you wanting to do it? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing that. I think Nate, you have a few questions now. Do I? Uh, probably. Uh, let me think here. Okay. Uh, so, so I, 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 um, what was I going to say? Okay. Um, as far as like common objections that come up to pre covenantal apologetics, I know I'm just, yeah, I got to work on it and you're helping me. So, um, what are some common objections to covenantal apologetics that, that are pretty frequent, um, that are, uh, that maybe you'd want to talk about if, if you'd like to answer some of those or. Yeah, well, you probably know some of these. Um, yeah, you know the uh, the Montgomery quote, uh, Van Til's descent into the abyss of fideism. 
uh, what, you know, that's, that's obviously meant to be pejorative. And what he means by that is, you know, the guy, the guy doesn't care about defense of the faith. Um, and, and actually, um, you know, in the Sproul Gerstner Lindsley volume, um, Gerstner made the same point that, that, uh, presuppositionalists don't defend the faith. They just, they just wind up presupposing. Um, so I think one, one of the things, one of the objections that's come is that this is, is nothing more, nothing less than fideism. Well, well fideism is, you know, a view that, um, that, that you have faith um, no matter what, in, in the face of no matter what, um, maybe even without any reason whatsoever. That's kind of fideism. That's the ism of the fide. And, um, you know, of course, Van Til's a Reformed theologian, uh, recognizes, uh, you know, the Augustinian tradition we, we believe in order to understand. So there's something to uh, that idea, but uh, Van Til also recognized and, and, and said uh, over and over again that the whole world is evidence for the existence of God. And, and, and you know, if, if you want a reason, open your eyes. At Calvin's point, you can't open your eyes without being compelled to see God there. Uh, so, um, so the impossibility, the contrary, is the reason, and 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 so it's not as you know maybe clean and uh, tight as a causality or contingency argument, but by the same token, you can use those arguments as I as I've said, uh, if you want to in your defense of Christianity. But part of what you're trying to help people recognize is that if you don't stand on the Principia of, of Scripture and, and the Triune God, if you don't recognize those to be your foundations, then you're bound to sink. And, and so let's, let's talk about what your foundation is, and let me try to help you see how that can't be a foundation, because it's already been tried, and it's already failed, and, you know, all, all these kinds of things are a part of your defense of Christianity. So it's not fideism. It, it certainly recognizes that, uh, that, that when you when, the, when you have spirit-wrought faith, um, you are renewed, as Paul says, unto knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. So the knowledge component is there, uh, but uh, we also recognize, as Van Til puts it, that people can understand intellectually the arguments that we give to. Uh, so uh, we're, we're giving them arguments. So we're, we're trying to say, I, there's, you know, the same way that the disciples said, John 6, Lord, where else can we go? You alone have words of eternal life. There's nowhere else to go. I don't have anything else to offer you but what Jesus has said and what God has said. And, 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 and I don't need anything else to offer you because you need that as desperately as I do. So let's talk about why you need that. You need that because you're standing here. Maybe you're standing on a, on a universe that's chance produced, and, and you think that in the midst of all of that chance, you've just oozed up from the slime. Well, uh, let's talk about the absurdity of that. Uh, because there's no evidence at, at any point in, in history, and in, in in however long you think history is, I don't care. There's no evidence at any point that that mind can come from non-mind, uh, that consciousness can come from non-consciousness. There's no evidence of any of it. You don't have it. Uh, so, um, so why would you why would you put your blind faith in this rather than mind coming from the one who's supremely? mind that is that is God himself so you know you're offering reasons it's not it's not fideistic in that sense um Clark Pinnock you know said Van Til uh thinks that he's, it's kind of a paraphrase but I'm getting most of the words right uh, Van Til thinks that um he can uh uh tout Christianity now these are his exact words without consulting objective reality now, see, Pinnock at that point in his life was thinking that Van Til was just strictly an a priorist, kind of like Clark is, just a priori. You just have an a priori. You don't have to consult objective reality. Well, the truth of the matter is Van Til sees that objective reality is all the revelation of God, and you can consult any and all of it uh, in, your, in your defense of Christianity because, as he says, you can start anywhere because wherever you start, God is there and God has already spoken uh, in and through the things that he's made. Uh, so that's a kind of, um, you know, evidential objection that, that, that objective reality doesn't matter. And for Van Til, objective reality is, is of course, uh, something that matters supremely because God speaks through it all. The heavens declare the glory of God. Um, so those are, those are some, ob some objections, um, you know, uh, Gerstner's objection that, that Van Til reasons in a circle. We've covered that. That was an objection going all the way back in the Reformation. Uh, Fuchsius has an article on that as well as does Owen. So this is not something Van Til invented or is just 
um, unique to his position. It's, it's unique to the reform position because we had to recognize, we did recognize by God's grace, the reality of what scripture is. Uh, so the circularity, the a priori, the evidential, um, the, one of the bigger ones maybe, in, so maybe just in some circles, one of the bigger ones is um, that uh, Ventil says the unbeliever can't know anything. You, you've probably heard that. Uh, over and over again. And um, I actually had a discussion, a short discussion about this. Uh, on Planninga. Um, I wrote my dissertation on, on Dr. Planninga. And again, um, a very uh, gracious man, um, appreciated him very much. Uh, but Planninga has a critique of Van Til and, and, and uh, initially that critique was, well, Van Til says the unbeliever can't know anything. Uh, well, what Van Til's after in that discussion is uh, if, if you think of knowledge as a whole and not just as a data bit, if you recognize that what you know connects to other things that you know, so that the things that you know are connected in your own mind to who you are and how you navigate and negotiate the world, uh, then, as Van Til would put it, epistemologically, the unbeliever can't really know because in order to know what a thing is, you need to know that it's speaking about who God is and it's God's own creation by virtue of his providential control. So if you don't know it as that, you don't know the thing as it is. But, but of course, you can know things. Two plus two equals four. I know that. Pagans know that. So that's the same on that level. But as Van Til liked to say, it's not the unbeliever, it's not that the unbeliever can't count, it's that he cannot account for counting. So what's underneath the two plus two equals four? Yeah, what's, what's the foundation for mathematics in the first place? So those kinds of things, uh, you know, are, are, are difficult. Van Til says the knowledge situation is difficult because um, it, people made in the image of God, uh, because they're made in the image of God and because of God's common grace, of course, they're still going to be able to navigate, negotiate the world in various ways. Um, but underneath it all is rebellion. Underneath it all is suppression of the truth and unrighteousness. And so they're, they're holding down what the fact actually is, but they're taking the fact as much as it'll, it'll give them what they want. Uh, so, you know, not, not to get too controversial here, but this is why we see the culture going in the direction it is. This is why people now routinely acknowledge that you can't tell uh, what a male is and what a female is by looking uh, because why you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Uh, you, you don't see what's in front of you. You're going to say, I'm the one who defines that. I'll decide what it is. And that's a that's a fist in the air assertion of autonomy. Uh, so. So do we have that in common with the unbeliever? No, we don't, because we recognize that God's. Uh, creation speaks because God is speaking through it. Uh, so the reason that for multi thousands of years of history, people have recognized that there are males and there are females is because God speaks through those facts and they're patently obvious. But we're in a, in a much more difficult situation. The wrath of God is extended to us now to such an extent where people not only deny, but celebrate the denial of the obvious. Uh, and that's, you know, so we ought not think that we have those things in common anymore either, because the suppression of the truth is alive and well in those kinds of situations. That was excellent. Yeah. Uh, before you said uh, you, they can count, but can't account for the counting. I was so close to like saying that before you said that. So, yeah. you know, we're connected, it, isn't it? you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what you think, what, what you think, and people have thought for millennia, what, what you think is patently obvious has now become anything but obvious in the speech of people, not in their minds, because they know better, but in the speech of people uh, who want their autonomy. I will define uh, who I am. You better not define that. And you better celebrate the fact that I'm going to define that. And the Christian has to say, no, we don't have that option because we're creatures. We're not autonomous. And God has already defined a good bit of what the world is like. And our responsibility Mine and yours is to think God's thoughts after him. So God says male, God says female. That's what we're meant to say as well. Mm, that's so helpful. Thank you, Scott. That's really, really good. Yeah, it makes me think of, I don't know if it's in one of the pastoral epistles, first or second Timothy, when he talks about um, particular set of unbelievers 
you know, glory in their rebellion or glory in their, uh, uh, their kind of, you know, they, I forget exactly what it says. I'm trying to, um, who know, whatever, but it says something along the same lines, similar to Romans one of just yeah. people literally just, Hey, you know, look how they boast in their rebellion against God. And they think right. you're strange that you don't join in with them. Um, yeah. Yeah, R Romans one thirty two. Even though we know all of us together the requirements of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, Paul says we not only do those things, but we give hearty approval to those who practice them. In other words, it becomes it becomes societal. And Romans one thirty two is just a description of um, of our culture at this point. You give hearty approval. You celebrate the denial of what God has uh, put forth, uh, obviously, and um, clearly in his creation. And you celebrate the denial of that. Calvin actually says his comment on 132, uh, he says, uh, at this point, uh, there's no longer uh, any opportunity for reformation. Now, I don't think he was as pessimistic as, as what that sounded, but I think what he's saying is, uh, at, if you get to this point, if your society gets to this point, uh, the church better be ready and better be active in terms of gospel proclamation. That's the only thing that's going to pull people uh, out of that kind of uh, base uh, rebellion that, you, you know, we just, we just haven't seen in history um, for, for millennia, really. Mm. Yeah, that's great, Scott. And, and one, one quick follow-up uh, to a similar topic. When we talk about, you know, Christian philosophy or just philosophy in general, I'm sure you're aware that that uh, in a sense, Christian philosophy is becoming very popular, um, and a lot of uh, younger younger guys coming, especially with YouTube and things like that. You have, you know, capturing Christianity, and and you have a lot of these kind of you know young guys coming up. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on particular movements like that, because um, you know it seems like they kind of promote any and all kinds of ideas. Um, and seem to be okay with promoting that. And I was just, you know, as a Christian, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but as a Christian, I'm just like, why, why do, why do we want to be like the world? Why do we want to be academic and philosophers and almost like have this prom promoting our own intellect? And I see that danger uh, with a lot of people my age, you know, almost 30 probably. And, and I'm just worried about you know, young guys like that. I wonder what your thoughts are on, you see this kind of pool of people. I, I've even seen some covenantal guys that would, they've departed from that in order, in my speculative opinion, in order to kind of fit in with these more rigorous crowds that would be more acceptable, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a massive topic, isn't it? Um, I, yeah, I, I contributed to a book called Christianity and Philosophy and uh, kind of set forth my view there. They actually called it covenantal um, philosophy. And, you know, they, the authors were very kind and, and, and uh, I was glad to work with them, the editors, I mean. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was, I, what I said in, in that chapter on Christian and philosophy is that uh, philosophy has to have um, a principial foundation in order to do what it does. And that means that it's dependent. It can't be an autonomous discipline. Um, it, it has to be, if it's going to be done properly, it has to have its roots in who God is and what he has said. And those are your boundaries, all right? That's, you know, as, as people have put it sometimes, that's the fence that's built. Within that fence, you've got some room to move, uh, but you don't go over the fence. Um, uh, and so um, when, when philosophy uh, goes over the fence or starts to um, tinker with that or play with that, uh, danger sets in uh, not only um, conceptually, but, but personally. And, and that's, where, that's where problems can come in. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I, I always have always appreciated about Van Til, and this is more from what I heard about him than from my um, encounters with him, because again, I didn't have him in class, but um, it's been said to me that uh, one of the beauties of Van Til uh, in his, his persona was that he didn't care about having a place at the table. And, and I think that mm. that's probably a good, a good thing to think about. Um, you can do that wrongly, of course, um, and, and pridefully, I don't wanna play because I'm da 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 
but the point was um, he, he really wasn't that concerned about how acceptable he was to the guild. Um, may, maybe that maybe the philosophers didn't take him seriously. Maybe a lot of theologians um, thought he was all wet. His concern was just try, just remain faithful and and uh, and try to help the church and help Christians recognize uh, the reality of apologetics, the you know the the, uh, the power of apologetics when it's when it's uh, uh, done in the proper way because of the power of the gospel and the power of scripture um, and and let the chips fall. So so I think um, the, the danger of philosophy can be that it's it, it can be for people, um, and I count myself as one of these, uh, for whatever reason, this, this is what the Lord called me to, but people who, who really like academics and, and you know, who, who can be tempted to just have their nose in the books all the time and, and let the rest of the world go by, um, philosophy can be very seductive um, because the arguments can be, can, can, can be so, um, uh, they can be articulated in such a way that they sound very impressive. Um, and and I, still, I still read that stuff and I still actually enjoy reading that stuff, but, but not because um, I think, oh, wow, this is never, but because you know, you're, you're trying to see how people are gonna work out some of the big questions in the world, whether the theological or the philosophy of religion questions, or even just the straight philosophical way. You wanna see what, what minds do, minds that are beyond mine, you know, what are these brains doing? And, and uh, th th those things are, to me are fascinating and interesting, but, but you, you dare not be seduced by it to such an extent that you think, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe this whole Christian thing's a bit naive, or maybe I do need more reasons than just the Bible is the word. Maybe I really need some philosophical substance here in order to get to that. That's where things go wrong and they can go wrong conceptually and, and more importantly, they can go wrong personally. So I always I tell students in, in my class, um, if you're interested in philosophy, wanna go in, into philosophy, be very, very careful because of the seductive uh, nature of it and, and be grounded theologically before you ever uh, touch the stuff. Um, I, I've got this story I'll just tell quickly. When I was a pastor in Texas, we had we had a man who was a relatively new Christian, and I was uh, trying to disciple him and working with him, and uh, he became interested in apologetics. So we began to talk about those things, and he, he came into my uh, office one day, really kind of out of the blue, and said, I've, I've applied to philosophy program, been accepted, so I'm going, and, um, and he said, just wanted you to know, and I said, you know, uh, maybe this would be a good idea in, in a year or two or three, but, um, but I would really uh, counsel you to wait and uh, let's, let's keep going where we're going. Let's keep doing what we're doing. Let's get a little more time under your belt, a little more established, and, and then maybe it'd be time to go. And, um, you know, um, this happens in the church quite a bit, unfortunately, uh, against the advice of, of his pastor, he went and, um, and uh, before a year was out, he'd written us a letter saying he denied the faith and and uh, was enjoying his philosophy program, and off he went. And you know, you could it's kind of, you could you could see it. You could see that that he was just he loved the intellectual stuff. And and we have to be careful uh, as as Christians that we don't we don't fall in love with our brains and with the ideas and concepts, but we we worship and serve a person, the Lord Jesus, and then and then all the things uh, implicated through that. Uh, can be fascinating, interesting to us, but they have to have the right focus and the right center. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that, Scott. That grieves my heart. Um, it's always so sad to see people get caught up in 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 these ideas and these things, and and I think it's just it's sad because I think we all need to be on guard against the reality of the deceitfulness of sin, and and we got to be on guard against. Um, one wanting that uh, it's a worldly desire where we want to be noticed we want to be someone um and and yeah, it's just and sad when that happens it is sad and you know in my in my experience um the way you can pick it out i don't want to be overly simplistic here but the way you can pick it out is it's it, it, it happens to people whose focus is obviously on themselves um it, it really does. You can see somebody who's sort of overly self-focused and then that turns into, because I like this, I'm going for that. And, and, and they crash and burn. So, 
you know, I, you just, we just encourage people, get your eyes off yourself, put your eyes on Christ. And then everything that follows from having your eyes on Christ are worthy of, of your time and your, your desire. But remember where the center is. Remember where the focus is. Don't go over there as if that's the focus. That follows from who Christ is, but don't lose who Christ is. And, and um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's where you're rooted. That's where you stay. Mm. That's so helpful. And yeah, Lord, just protect us from that. Jesus yeah. name. Um, it, it's just, it's such a, I, I, I get, I, I'm so gra- glad how you answered that. Um, Scott, because I just see a lot of these younger guys coming up and I just worry for them, you know, and I know I'm probably a remnant kind of guy that just cares for their soul because I just, yeah. it, uh, I'm not a pastor or anything, but I have this kind of this pastoral heart for a lot of these young guys. I see that want to make a name and they want to be seen as intellectually rigorous. And, and some guys even, you know, become Roman Catholic just because that seems to be the cool philosophy thing to do. And, and I just see all this stuff yeah. and it, it grieves me. Um, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know where Nick disappeared to, but I'm sure he'll come back. He's had enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dallas is in. Oh, his power went out. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Knocked him off. Oh, bummer. bummer. I guess it's all that rain. Uh, but Dallas, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I just got back. I had to take a shower after work and I want to listen, but I had to make dinner, you know, because I was starving. So I just have a laptop in my kitchen, but I don't want to be like a distraction, you know, so so I'm doing a couple of things, but I am listening because I need to soak any Bible Jesus knowledge in that I can. Yeah, great. Yeah, Scott, uh, Dallas is uh, he's one of the other hosts that came in a little late, but. Oh, hey, Dallas. Yeah, I. uh, We're just kind of a small group of guys that want to love Jesus and, and grow in our, our humility first and foremost, and grow in our, our knowledge and understanding of our Lord. And so, I, yeah, in a sense, we're kind of okay with never being someone special. I mean, we just, we want to bless specifically our, our local congregations that listen to us. We want to bless the local church. And if it goes outside right. of that, we, we praise the Lord for that because we know it starts with our families, our wives, our children, you know, and as a good Presbyterian, we know we got to lead our families well. Um, yeah, good for you. So we, we want to really focus on that and, and in our family consistency of leading our, our children and our wives to the Lord and though, and then, you know, local church, it goes out from there, but yeah, we're just, yeah, we love Jesus and we're so grateful for everything you're saying, Scott. Um, so appreciative of everything you've done for the Lord. Um, and we're it's good to meet you guys for sure. Yeah. I, I appreciate your focus. I sure do. Yeah. Well, Scott, can I ask you one question really quick? My, yeah, uh, we have it's stormy here in this, uh, my internet went out on me. Um, first of all, Baptists love their wife. Their Baptists love their wives and children too, Nate. Just want to <laughs> clarify real quick. I know reform. We try. Yeah. We try. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, um, so I just had a quick question about, uh, I think it was Schaefer who drew us, drew a distinction between um, evangelism and apologetics. And the way that I've always done presuppositional apologetics, um, and I've, I think I, I mentioned to you that I listened to you first, like 10 to 12 years ago, and that was kind of my beginning into it. I've read a, read a bunch since then. I'm not a philosophical guy, philosophical guy very simple. Uh, you know, I just like the sufficiency of scripture and I run with that. Um, I've always viewed evangelism as the heart of my apologetic and, and that really all I'm doing is trying to make the person I'm, you know, doing apologetics with, um, despair in their hope. Like I want to help them understand that their hope isn't consistent. It's a false hope. And then, you know, so that I can then give them the gospel to give them true hope. Um, and I've just never viewed that distinction between like evangelism and apologetics. Um, would you say that we, that there is a distinction there or that evangelism should be at like the center of our apologetic? Yeah, my, my own view is the latter. Um, I, you know, uh, in, in Jerusalem and Athens, the, the Festrift that was written for Van Til, um, 
there, you know, there's, there's a lot of give and take in that, which is, is fun to read. And uh, there's an essay, it might even be the last one by uh, a dear uh, saint, Fred Howe, who was a professor at Dallas Seminary. And um, I think that's right. Um, and and how you know writes a fairly long essay on one of the problems of Van Til's. He doesn't properly uh, separate apologetics from evangelism. And um, you know it was it was an interesting essay, but uh, Van Til's response was fairly quick and short. And um, he said, uh, "You're right, um, Doctor. How I don't um, separate those, and that's that's intentional." So again. Um, when, when, when I talk to students, I, I say you can think about apologetics as maybe premeditated evangelism. And, and what I mean by that is um, that there can be differences um, between apologetics and straight evangelism. When I was involved in Young Life, you know, I was dealing with, if you've ever been to Young Life camp, you know, you start with who's Jesus and then what about the cross and the resurrection and now what are you going to do? You know, you, those are kind of basics of, of gospel presentation all well and good and absolutely important. Uh, in, in apologetics, um, maybe you're starting with um, someone's basic objection to Christianity. You know, you, you Christians, uh, you know, all I see on the news is uh, sexual abuse by you Christians in your churches. Why should I be involved in something like that? All right, good question. Um, let's talk about that and, and let's think about what, what the issues are here and, and why that's a problem. Uh, and if you're going to if you're going to defend the faith in context of that kind of objection, you're going to address the objection, uh, even if it's, you know, less um, personal. Maybe it's just a uh, God can't exist uh, because of the amount of evil in the world. That's a popular one. OK, good. Let's talk about that. So you're going to address the objection. But but what I say is you're always wanting, as the Lord allows, you're wanting to move that to Christ and to the gospel as seamlessly as possible. And this is one of the things that I loved about Van Til when I first started reading him, you know, I was involved in Young Life and I was in the ministry of evangelism. And what I was seeing was the things that Van Til is saying, as much as I'm able to understand them, these things are seamless with the presentation of the gospel. They go, they go hand in glove here. And I had never seen that before because I was, when I was converted, I was given Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict. And, and I thought those things were great and fun, but the reason I thought they were is because I was a Christian. And so they, they helped me see, you know, here, oh, here's what I believe and here's some of the support. Uh, what I didn't recognize is the non-Christian's gonna, you know, throw that stuff out. Um, they're not gonna have any interest in that sort of thing. So what I, what I like to say is, yeah, there, there are going to be maybe some, uh, some uh, differences in emphases in the way we, uh, perhaps present, present um, uh, the gospel in the context of objections, but the gospel is still front and center in terms of what we want to do and what we want to say. So as the Lord allows, we want to be able to say, well, I see what you're saying here, uh, but let me tell you why I believe what I believe. And, and, and you're, you're asking them to get on your ground, and at that point, you're, you're going to help them recognize, hey, by the way, I'm in the same boat you are. I'm a sinner uh, in desperate need of grace. I can't save myself either. So we're on the same plane at that point. But now let me tell you what's different. Um, let me tell you what the Lord has done. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to make, uh, yeah, maybe a, a, a kind of distinction. Um, you know, Sproul's famous uh, analogy, when the doctor opens your chest up and operates you want him to make a distinction between your heart and your liver, but you don't want him to separate those. So no separation in, in any of that. Maybe some distinctions in terms of emphases, but but when you're I think when you're you're engaged in reformed apologetics, the focus is the gospel and who Christ is and what he's done. And that's where you want to go. And you want to try to answer objections in a way that's going to take you there. I think that's what Paul does in, in Athens in Acts 17. He just goes right. At the end to the resurrection, then he's you know, God commands all men to repent. And by the way, um, he's given you proof. He's raised somebody from the dead, and and he's coming back. So it's you know it's right there. That's that's where he stops. So he moves from idolatry to oh by the way, here's the one you ought to serve. Here's the one you ought to worship. Thank you. That's great. Uh, how you doing, Scott? I'm okay. Okay. Uh, this is a fr uh, so we have a friend. Uh, his name's 
well, he's his internet name is uh, Vincent the Fake Greg Bonson or something like that. He's one of them internet apologists, and uh, him and his buddy are big fans of your work. Um, and uh, one of them had a question and asked if I could ask you it. Um, it's, okay. it's maybe a little heftier than uh, the other things we've talked about thus far, but I'm sure you're capable. And if not, I don't know. Whatever, move on. Um, if I don't know, I'll tell you. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think we need to be better at doing that. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, this is how it goes. Um, this is Vincent speaking here. Quote, I am wondering his thoughts about a necessary, uh, or I'm sorry, necessitarian. Oh, no. Necessitarian. Yes, thank you. Necessitarian right. position that would maintain that the world reflects and reveals God. And because it does that, God couldn't create another world because another world would reveal God differently. But God can't be different than what he is. So either God could have not created or he must have created this world. This is similar to moral principles that can't otherwise uh, uh, that can't be otherwise because they reveal God's character. So he was just curious on what your thoughts were on that. That kind of statement yeah. there. OK, good. Good for Vincent. Um, I, I would uh, I, I would hold with the. Uh, the, the reformed, as far as I know, all the reformed hold this. Um, and when I'm talking about the reform, I'm, I'm kind of in 16th, 17th century. And then people beyond that I've read, such as uh, Hodge, Bobby, Turton, um, Kuiper, did he deal with this? Yeah. Um, so I, I would hold with that group of people um, that God's uh, creation of the world and everything else was a free determination of God to do that, among other things that he might have done, but determined not to do. So, um, so, so when, when I think of the, the Pactum Salutis, uh, or we could say the decree generally, and then subset under the decree is the Pactum Salutis, uh, which is uh, God's um, uh, covenant of salvation between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All of that uh, was by virtue of God's free determination to do it. There was no point at which God had to do that. Um, if he had to do that, then there's a certain dependence on something outside of God in order for God to be who he is, because the necessity presses the dependence by by definition if it's necessary for him to do it that means there's something about god that requires something outside of god not not something uh that is outside of god contingently but something that's required that's what necessity is so there can't be anything outside of god on which he's dependent at all he is who he is and so because of that uh, the Reformed have always held that God's determination to create is a free determination, and in that sense, could not be necessary. Once he determines, I will create this world, by virtue of that determination, it necessarily happens. But the determination is prior to that necessity. So Turretin, for example, calls it a hypothetical necessity. So there cannot be anything, let me try to put it this way, there cannot be anything that's absolutely necessary except God. Anything else that's necessary other than God is only hypothetically necessary, or sometimes we say contingently necessary because it's contingent on God's predetermination to do it. We, uh, we spoke with... Vin, um... Yeah, well, Vincent, we spoke with Vincent on the phone today, and um, I'm going to ask it maybe another way from how I understood what he said. Um, when we spoke, he, if I understood him correctly, I think what his friend was asking specifically was more about the created world and did God, the, the world that exists today, the reality that we have today did God basically have to create this world as a result of it, of his character? So basically like I've heard the argument this way that God creates the best of all possible worlds because God is perfect and he would never create anything other than the best world to reflect his glory. Like does the character of God in his personality in his being, 
necessitate the world that we have or could he have created things differently? Does that make sense? It does make sense. And, and the, the reformed answer to that is he could have made things differently because, because what he did do was just, um, if I could, you know, I have to struggle for words here, but um, so we're, we have to kind of anthropomorphize the answer here. What God did do is pick out a possibility and make it an actuality. But, but there were other possibilities available to him. Now, now, what those possibilities are, we're not really privy to. But, for example, um, God could have made a world uh, where uh, frogs speak and uh, engage in conversation with human beings. Um, that's not outside the realm of possibility. It's outside the realm of reality. Um, but God could have made that kind of world. But what, what philosophers do tend to say, some philosophers, the ones that I agree with, what they tend to say is the only way we can understand possibility is that it has to be indexed in some way to reality. So we don't know what possibilities are out there uh, in the mind of, in the infinite, eternal, immutable mind of God. What possibilities are there? We don't know. The, the best we can do is to say, things could be different than they are now so that it's possible that God create a world where frogs converse with human beings, but he didn't do that. Um, there's, there's nothing intrinsic in reality that would be an affront to God if he did that. Um, so he could have done it, but um, he didn't create the world in that way. So, you know, we're, 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 we're on the margins here of speculation when we start thinking about possibilities but the reason we affirm that um, that that this creation is not the only thing God could have done is because we recognize given his sovereign power sometimes called his absolute power that he could have that, that he could have done things in vastly different ways we just don't know what those ways are because all we know is what we've got and what we've got is God's creation and God's revelation. Um, but I, I don't think there's there's any place for us as Reformed Christians uh, to say that creation is necessary for God. Um, it's it's a free determination of God in his in his uh, eternal infinite wisdom. Mm. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, I think it too. It, it, I think it's uh, a good. I like what you're saying because it kind of I think would put outside the bounds of a lot of people that want to kind of put. Uh, objections to God's character in light of some outside kind of standard that's not God in himself. It's just kind of an arbitrary, like, well, God's unjust in how he treated people in the Old Testament. Therefore, God didn't do that. So therefore, libertarian free will. I don't know. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, I think um, if I could just put it this way, uh, the, the fact of contingency is one of the most difficult things uh, I think to deal with uh, in, in the world because we all recognize, uh, all of us on this uh, podcast here, we all recognize that God is uh, meticulously sovereign. That is that he determined what would happen and he ordains whatsoever comes to pass. But as our confession says, that doesn't, that doesn't negate the reality of contingency, uh, e even of uh, our, our own uh, free choices. And Westminster Confession 9 talks about our, our free will, um, but it's not um, an autonomous free will. So we, we can't go that direction, which is where a sort of a more Arminian uh, uh, Roman Catholic view would put you. Uh, but we still recognize the reality of contingency, even in the midst of God ordaining whatsoever comes to pass. Those are difficult things. I think Van Til helps us there by talking about limiting concepts. We have to take both things and define one in vir by virtue of the other and the other by virtue of one. And then we, we affirm both of them, but we, we're not able to really to put them together very well. Very helpful. Uh, Sam, um, how, how are you, man? I'm good. I'm, I'm just soaking everything up. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm having a great time. Thank you so much, Scott, really. You're welcome. I really appreciate in particular what you said about kind of um, head knowledge versus heart knowledge. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but like as far as guys who kind of get off the track, because I, I honest, to be frank, I find that temptation constantly to get 
the way you phrased it to get more to keep your eyes on what you're studying and the ideas and rather than on Christ and on his lordship and I don't know it's just sobering and also encouraging um to hear that kind of thing so thank you yeah you're welcome I think it's a particular uh Maybe I'm so this is just me. I think it might be a particular problem among the reformed because because we just we, we really get excited about what we believe and we should, um, I think. I mean, I, when I was converted, I was converted by some dear people, um, many of whom still still around, still alive. But they're they're basically Armenian folks and they discipled me and they loved me and I appreciate them immensely and the Lord put them in my life. But when I moved from that to, to becoming reformed, I remember telling somebody this in the, in the year, you know, or the time when Star Wars first came out, I remember telling somebody it's like going to light speed. All of a sudden you've left everything behind and you're in a, you're in a whole new world. And, and uh, you know, you, you get excited about those kinds of things because you're reading the Bible and so many things are coming together again. And that's the great beauty of it. But that can also become detrimental to us can't it if we think that that's all that that what we're about are these things and these truths and these propositions no what we're about is how all these things relate to uh, christ uh, who shows us shows us the father through the spirit so we, we've got to keep that focus in mind when we're dealing with all these other things or we we lose our way and we we become insular we become uh we become narrow uh, we become our own little world. We think uh, nobody out there measures up. And, um, you know, we, we've all seen those kinds of situations and hope the Lord won't um, take us into that. Yeah. Once again, it just points to how, how important it is as we're reading. It's not just about the, you know, I love, you know, me and Nick and I'm sure Sam would attest. We, we love uh, the work of Joel Beakey, um, his, mm -hmm. his call to personal piety and family worship. I mean, some of them things were lacking so much in me and Nick's even our life. And um, as of, as a kind of not Presbyterian, I don't know, I don't even know what I was, just whatever, a Christian uh, that probably would find himself in a Baptist church and never really think about ecclesiology or anything like that or family mm -hmm. worship. And then finding that stuff, it was like uh, the Lord just really used that to stir us on to um, doing a better job with uh, our personal time of worship, personal time of reading. And, and I think it's, I, that's what I love. I, I know uh, one of your colleagues, Vern Poitras, um, uh, right? Yes. I think, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, he, he, uh, his, his call to humility and our, our approaching the scripture and realizing that let it correcting us and, and calling us to that. It, it's just so, so important that we let the word actually be working on us um, and, yeah. and not winning an argument. Um, right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the way to, to think about it. And, and you're right. Dr. Bickey's helped so many, uh, you know, his sort of call it a Puritan approach to the, to the way we think about the Christian life is just so helpful and, and edifying and, and um, a good, a good emphasis to maintain. Amen. Yeah. And it kind of all harkens back to the ultimate apologetics verse, right? Uh, set up, is it sanctify or set apart Christ in your mm -hmm. heart, you know, and you have to have that part before you can lovingly defend the gospel in a, in a Christ exalting way. So yeah, exactly right. And, and Peter says there that we're to do it with, with reverence and awe. So, you know, it's, it can be easy for us to, um, to get mad at people who object. And, um, we, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert on this by any stretch, but what we have to remind ourselves of is uh, we would have, we would have objected except for the grace of God. And so we recognize this is what sin does. And um, so we respect people for who they are. And we, we try um, as the Lord allows to help them uh, recognize that the only answer to all of this is, is what Jesus has told us. Hmm. So good. Uh, Nick, did you want to uh, talk about that particular uh, topic? Um, that... I wasn't gonna. No, I think we're okay. good. Okay. I mean, if you want to talk briefly, just um, about you know what you believe on divine simplicity. I mean, I know that there's been a bit of brouhaha, and just uh, you know having. If you just want to talk about that for a second, great. If not, that's cool too. But um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, I've I've written about this in various places and and uh, always affirm simplicity. I, I think uh, 
my, my own personal view is that there's uh, more emphasis on this than there ought to be. Um, it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of an abstract uh, doctrine and, be, and can, be, uh, can be extremely austere with some people, particularly Thomas. Um, I prefer to think about aseity as the reason why we're meant to affirm uh, simplicity. Um, and I, I think, as I, as I was saying a little while ago, um, one, of the, one of the more difficult matters for uh, Christian, Reformed Christians and Christians generally is contingency. Um, and the fact that God freely determines to do something um, nudges uh, uh, an austere view of simplicity in a particular way because God himself is necessary. So I can't figure all of that out because God is mysterious. Um, but um, I, I do uh, agree because I'm a Westminster Confession man that God is without body parts or passions. Um, and then I have to try to work with what that means uh, in, in, what, um, in what I'm reading in scripture and, and how, to, how to think about that in terms of what uh, scripture tells me. And, and when, when I think about simplicity, I tend to go immediately to a seity because I think God's uh, name as Yahweh uh, is an expression of his aseity, and, and aseity means that God is who he is and is dependent on nothing, absolutely nothing, to be who he is, and so everything that he is, he is, um, and so there are no parts in that sense, um, and then we have to work through um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are those parts? No, they're not parts. Uh, they're subsistent relations. They're uh, personal, uh, and uh, each is the one God. And so now we're getting into all kinds of language that's very difficult, if not impossible, for us to comprehend. Um, but I think simplicity is important because of aseity. Uh, and, I, and I don't think, it, maybe this is an overstatement, but I don't think it ought to have a life of its own. Um, I think that's moving in a direction that um, tends to... Uh, uh, undermine, maybe tends to undermine our confession of God's aseity. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Dallas, hey, how are you? Would you like to say anything to Scott? Um, Scott, you are intelligent. I, I am appreciating everything you're saying. It was wonderful to make my chicken fajita while hearing all this stuff, you know, after a long day of welding. So, uh, I just, um, I'm just loving the Bible stuff, you know, I'm just, I'm mostly just getting to the point now where I've told my wife, you're going to listen to me when I read the Bible to you at night, cause we're figuring this out on the man of the house. We're going to learn it, you know, in the most loving way I can, of course, you know, but yeah, even if you're sleepy, I'm reading you some of Matthew tonight. So, I mean, yeah, I, all this stuff is a little high level for me at this point, but I mean, I'm understanding in a way. But not really too many uh, questions on this stuff. Just mostly, uh, I like how you discern or uh, describe that one word you just said, God's uh, aseity. Yeah, you described it right after you said it, and I was like, "Thank you, thank you." <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when God says, "I am who I am," um, he's he's utterly independent and is the only one who is or could be independent. That's what aseity means. So it just means God is independent of anything and everything else because he's God and, and, and nothing else is. And so there's no possibility he could be dependent. Now I can use that word. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I say, I say from himself, I see it. He just means he's from himself. Uh, All right. Good. Good. Brilliant. Okay. I like it. <laughs> so, and, and as a Texan, I like your first name. So we have, we have oh, Hey, connection. yeah, there we go. Good. good. I like Texas, you know, I, yeah. I've never, well, I've only been there once, but you know, it seems like a pretty awesome place. It's a I got good some state. friends that live there. Yeah. Yeah. Dallas is a, he's been a Christian um, uh, for, I don't know. I, we always change it maybe a year. Yeah. Who knows? Only, only the Lord knows, but um, yeah. me and me and him grew up together. Best friends. Uh, Lord saved me first. And then a few years later, uh, got a hold of Dallas. Um, so oh. Yeah, we both were pagans at one point, and oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. Excellent. Well, so da you guys Dallas can is yeah. sharpen each other. Yeah, Dallas is super excited. He's he's got his new Reformation Study Bible, and he's Very he's good. diving in and yeah. figuring all this stuff out, and and uh, 
And I always tell them if there's any evidence of a born again Christian, it's someone that just is obsessed with reading their Bibles. So good job. That's great. Yeah. Excellent. Good to I hear. thought it was great that I had four bookmarks at first in my new one. Cause the one bookmark wasn't enough. I needed like my reading me and the wife's reading. I needed church in the morning and then I need Sunday school, you know, like, but then I realized that four are, that's already taken up. You know, I already used them all. Like I don't have anything in the Psalms right now. I was, yeah. Keep so it you always need more bookmarks, you know, you can always use right. more bookmarks in the Bible. Got one last uh, thing I just want to mention. I appreciate your, uh, your Latin pronunciation. I'm a classicist by training and Principia uh, is, I feel wow. like a, not necessarily a, what you'd expect for that word, which I appreciated over the ecclesiastical version. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm not a classicist, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to pronounce it correctly. Thank you. For some perspective, Sam learned uh, learned class uh, uh, Koine Greek for his classical studies, and then when he became a Christian, he just decided to learn Hebrew because why not? You know. Wow. So, <laughs> excellent. Sam's language brilliant. Language guys, language guys, we need them. They're great. Yeah, Sam is our probably our academic in the podcast. Uh, yeah. So we much appreciate, you know, we, we have good different differing perspectives on our show that hope to bring the best out of every, you know, for the lay person, for the more experienced lay person, for the more smarter person, you know, so we try to, yeah. so it's able to be a blessing as many people as possible in our churches. Yeah. So good for you guys. Yeah. Do, um, do you have anything? I think um, unless you want to keep going, Scott, it seems like we may be winding down a bit here. Is there anything? Yeah, that's good else that you want to uh you know talk about specifically like maybe something that you know you think is really important with apologetics we haven't discussed or maybe something about van till that you know you know from having you know done life with him whereas most of us wouldn't know that anything no i think you know what i, what I was saying to you uh, initially maybe is worth uh, saying again that when, when i knew van till you know after his teaching career uh, and and was able to stay with him for a time. Um, it just uh, still sticks in my mind that when we would we would walk in his neighborhood, he was always talking about the gospel and talking about Christ. And you know, and that was that was in the uh, in the eighties. And I was I was recognizing through that interaction, here was a man who uh, everything he wrote on these pages that was so hard for me to get and took, took me a while to get, and I had to write him letters and I had to talk my philosophy. All of that uh, was for the sake of the gospel so that he could be able to talk, to talk not only to his, his neighbors, but to talk to, to anyone. So I have one quick story and then I'll, then I'll finish. Uh, I was in, in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago giving a talk, and after it was over, a man came up to me, and he said he was an alumnus of Westminster Seminary, that he'd been here in the 50s, and um, he, said, uh, I, he said, I had the privilege one day, uh, Van Til was going to go speak at Johns Hopkins to the philosophy department, and he said he asked me, um, this man said he asked me to drive him down, so he said I was happy to do it, so we got in the car, um, got on I-95, headed toward Baltimore, and uh, he said there was a, a tra traffic incident, and we were we were delayed over an hour. So he said by the time we got to Johns Hopkins, of course the philosophy department was there. They had all been waiting and waiting and waiting. No cell phone during that, so they're just waiting. And Van Til turns turns up. Uh, they are late, and they say we only have sorry, but we only have 30 minutes. And this man said what Van Til did is he set his notes aside that he had prepared for the philosophy department. And he pulled out his Bible and he preached a sermon on Jonah. So that tells you the heart of a man. Everything that you read about Van Til that's up in the clouds, it's difficult to understand. He's, he's, de he's dealing with philosophers who speak that language. So he's trying to speak their language in order to get them to understand the reality of the gospel. But when, when push comes to shove and Van Til's got to talk to the philosophy department, he's only got 30 minutes. He's not that interested in telling them his philosophy. He's interested that they hear the gospel. And that's what he did. He, he preached the gospel to him. So, so I would say to, 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 to you guys, uh, decades younger than me, uh, you, you want to end your life that way. You want to finish as uh, people who are, whose eyes are on Christ, who are committed to the Lord. Uh, if you have uh, uh, only five minutes to say something to somebody, you want them to hear the gospel. Yeah. You want to learn apologetics. You want to be able to defend the faith. 
but uh, when all is said and done, um, when, when it's about time to be over, uh, you, you want to see the grace of God and your perseverance and the, and, and the, and the singular focus on who Christ is and what he's done. And that, that's what, that's what Van Til taught me. That's awesome. Our pastor just preached a sermon, uh, very convicting. Uh, I think it was Sunday night. Cause you were there, Nate, um, mm-hmm. about persecution and about how a lot of people say we don't feel that in America, but our pastor challenged us and said, you know, how often do you evangelize your neighbors, your friends, your family? Like, you know, and he just made the argument, you know, that I, I bet if you, I bet if we were more consistently evangelizing those people and uh, doing the things that uh, maybe being more consistent with our words that we probably would feel, feel um, the pressure of being a Christian a little bit more, you know, so. Yeah. 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 There's some truth to that. That's right. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, Scott, I mean, what an honor. Uh, So, so grateful for you. And even your family, your offspring, you know, you got Jared, yeah. who's a tremendous, uh, intellectual, rigorous, uh, humble man. Um, really appreciated him. Very um, proud of him, yeah. Yeah. And I, I told him, I texted, I said, hey, we got your dad coming on. And and he was like, oh, that's that's great, you know. And I said, you know, maybe next time we'll have like a father and son episode and you guys can yeah. both come on and and uh, to share what... Uh, what life is like uh being in family as christians or something something yeah. fun you know something yeah. like that and right. uh but yeah man we're, we're just so grateful for you scott and we're so so honored uh to be able to look up to men like you that help you know lead us in our convictions to stay biblical to stay christian to stay committed to the lord jesus just as paul told us to imitate him as he imitates christ we look at you, Scott, and we say we imitate Christ because we want to imitate you in a sense. Oh, I, I might have got that backwards, but uh, that's, you that's, and then Christ, of course, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, but, that's uh, kind of you. But let me let me just say, too, what an encouragement it is to, to talk to you guys and to see, you know, another generation that's moving up with a with a proper focus and uh, an interest in these things. And I'm just uh, very encouraged to to see this and I'm glad to be able to chat with you guys for a while. I think it's been uh, fruitful for all of us. I'm very glad about that. Amen. Yeah, very much so. All right. Well, all right, guys. uh, Yeah. I'll close it out here. Uh, This is rooted in revelation where we seek to make God's revelation, our foundation. Thank you guys so much for listening.